OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Yeah, it's half seven. It's Friday morning. It is Jaron Michael Verney with you this morning. Michael, how are you? Good, Jaron, yourself? Yeah, um, plenty of us to get stuck into. Uh, big clash of games on Sunday afternoon, of course. Yeah, it's mad. We are you in Coker? I am, yeah. Uh, I've got the real sticky wicket, though. I'm covering the first game which means I'm going to have to go and get quotes after and write up my report during the second game. Right. So I, I don't know, what like, what do you do? Do you try and, you know, furiously type and then watch the second half or do you just miss the whole thing? There's no way catch I... Catch it back later. Yeah, there's no way, but, like, catch it back later. When, when you know the results. When, when you're sitting in Crow Park as yeah. well and you can hear everything going on around you. Yeah. Yeah, covering the first game is never good. I'm, I'm a bit down the totem pole, you see. So, <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, it's a pity. I don't know what I'd actually don't know what I'm going to do. What way to get around it? Because there's no way of avoiding the result or whatever. Uh, how, how good a game do you expect the first game to be? Yeah, pretty decent. Yeah, uh, when Cush and Dahl played Thomas's four years ago, they really pushed him. I think Thomas has got a last minute point, so they were the ancient champions, obviously, to win it. Thomas's are a lot better uh, now than they were then. Yeah, it'll be tight enough. T- four or five, I'd say, by Thomas is in the wind up, but it. Yeah, Dunloy beat Schlock Neil, who have been like a pebble in their shoe for a long time now uh, in the Ulster final. But yeah, you'd still be expecting Thomas to come through. Thomas's best performance of this whole run was against Ballyhea last year. And they came through Galway and got their five in a row in Galway. It was tough after a replay with Loch Ray, but they're as good as they've ever been. So, And they have a bit of revenge on their mind. Everyone talks about Ballyhea's revenge this weekend or yeah. redemption. Yeah. Thomas's definitely have a bit of revenge on their mind as well. Uh, I think. I- Everybody tends to write off the Ulster Club hurling champions, and then every three or four years, one of them produces a performance and reaches the final or wins the whole thing. Like, you know, this is not unheralded. And I'd say they're licking their lips at the fact that everybody's thinking about the other semi final, and it's going to be Thomas's versus whoever wins that. <coughs> uh, yeah, well, it's 10 years since Lock Eel won it, and um, that would have been a surprise. Uh, there's no point in saying any different. We would have had good battles with Dunlai down through the years. Schlock Neil have been close to Bally Hale, uh, they've been close to Bally Gunner last year as well. But if it was Schlock Neil, I'd be more confident maybe of an upset just because they're really seasoned. This is a kind of a new Dunlight team that maybe might need might need this semi final. But I do expect it to be close. They've got some great players like Keelan Malai, Conal Cunning, and the likes are as good of players as in the country. And it's great for them to get national exposure and in Crow Park as well. How real is the needle between Ballyhale and Ballygunner? It kind of it felt like it's it it didn't there was none, and then all of a sudden there was some. And the thing is, it, it as as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, everybody's reading everything. And it all seems to matter. <laughs> everything matters because you will literally pick up... Club managers and uh, players will literally take motivation from anywhere they can get. I, like, I've not been smart. I've been there. A, a look would be enough. A lad throwing you a look in a bar after a game or something would be enough. You, you take anything you can to motivate yourself or have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder. Uh, if I was Pat Hoban as the Ballyhale Shamrocks manager... I would have maybe told Colin Fenley maybe like maybe say that after if we if we beat them, but like that's the great thing about Colin Fenley. Like so, just was, for anybody who missed this, yeah, uh, Colin Fenley says that Ballyhale felt like they were somehow slighted in the victory speech last year when Ballygunner scored uh, a now famous mm. last second amazing winning goal, um, and the exact phrase that seems to have rankled was we robbed you today or what, what? yeah Barry Coughlin was the their vi- the vice captains last year Barry Coughlin and Philip Manny I don't know if Barry had actually given a speech for either the wins before that I think Philip had given the speeches but um, Barry wouldn't have given that many done that many interviews or even spoke that much and it was quite raw like cause it was just like you know it was a victory and he put, he, he threw an F-bomb in there into the, into the middle of it as well just with the emotion of it all but I actually watched it back earlier on this week I didn't think there was anything disrespectful in there and I was actually chatting the the Ballyhale manager from last year uh, James Joxer O'Connor yesterday and well, he said he didn't actually even hear the speech because he was that sick but uh, Colin Fenley obviously heard it um, it's funny because Colin knew he was going away after that game and it didn't look like he was going to be hurling with Ballyhale this year uh, at, at different stages and he said his hunger was lost but that was obviously something that worked something in the back yeah. of his mind and it's funny because uh Colin Fenley's going to be marking Barry Coughlin. Well, I was going to say, it, like, it ratchets up the pressure on himself. Yeah, prob- <coughs> probably, yeah. Um, he's never been one to shy away from pressure, though. I no. mean, he was sitting in here and he had a 
he had a good go at the, the defence forces the week of a game and I think he was man of the match that weekend um, I don't know maybe it spurs him on a bit but the, fa- the Fenley's rawness and his honesty like it's great for the media and he's helped to ratchet this game up a bit more it's almost like the GA went to him and said listen we need a bit of <laughs> it's going to be clashing with the World Cup <laughs> final we need you to ratchet it up a bit but listen that's the, I'm chatting a couple of couple of buddies back home and they're like you know a couple of interviews that are done after games and Judd Trump has done a few snooker interviews after matches where he's like you know bordering on you know being ignorant but it's like the best raw most raw yes. stuff is in that five or ten minutes when it's you haven't had time to regroup you haven't had time to go back to the changing room you're exhausted. you haven't had time to talk to someone you're exhausted you just like to look at some of Ronnie's interviews after those matches it's just like could anything could come out yeah. and listen that's good that's good for us sometimes maybe it's bad for him or other people but like that's the I suppose that's the beauty of post-match interviews and post-match quotes and that has teed up this game that was two weeks ago that's teed up this game beautifully um, it is unfortunate about the clash with the World Cup final. I mean, I, I know everybody's like, ah, sure, it is what it is, but like, no, it's not what it is, though. Like, the, it doesn't have to be, does it's it? It's avoidable to me. Like, we played club semi finals at Borough where we were playing in one venue at, at three o'clock, would say, and the other game was going on in another venue at three o'clock. You didn't get a chance to, wasn't one before the other, or anything like that. Traditionally, that's been the way uh, down through the years, maybe up until recently. So it's not, you know, a giant leap of faith to think that one game could be played here, one could be, game could be played there, and nothing clashes with the World Cup final. Listen, everybody that plays Hurling, follows Hurling, they're probably, they're sports fans, number one. They're GA fans, maybe number one, but they're sports fans, uh, you know, that's at the core of it all. And they want, to, like, it's comes around every four years I know it's never going to be probably at Christmas again unless there's some um, shenanigans around a future World Cup or something like that but there's just no need for it to happen and we are dilute the GA are diluting their audience for what is the biggest club game that has been played probably since 2009 since Ballyhale played Port and it was Henry against Joe and there's no need for it if you're trying to sell the split season more you give this a billing where it's not clashing with anything else like would a Saturday night have worked uh, could they put it back a week when they realised that okay the World Cup final is going to be that day it looks like there's a clash coming yeah the Camogie's obviously on Saturday so that's got that they have the whole bill on Saturday and that's live on RT as well but there's definitely some way of manoeuvring or moving it around um, I just don't think like I'm going to I well I don't know if I'll get to watch it live but I, I'm going to be there and a lot of other people will be there the Bally Hale people will be there and the Bally Gunner people will be there but don't I don't feel I don't know why you deny the casual supporter the chance to watch something that they want to watch especially with the salty uh, the extra salt this week but like last year was one of the all time great GA moments it's yeah. like right up there yeah ah yeah like Harry Ruddle like probably previously and Arn heard of it played intermediate with Bally Gunner that year I look back at the goal it's fascinating and James O'Connor was saying it yesterday he said like Owen Cody had a chance to pick the ball um, and I think he said Adrian Mullen had a chance to pick the ball Paddy Levy from Bally Gunner gets down makes this great pick up under a load of pressure then all of a sudden it just, the move starts moving and just opens up and I looked at it from behind the goals it's fascinating you know you talk about good inside forward you know great at creating space great at creating opportunity for himself Daisy Hutchinson just fans out because he knows that his defender is going to come with him and he knows he's going to create space for someone else and that creates space for Harry Ruddle to take a shot from about 30 yards and it was the like the whistle blows when Dean Mason pucks out the ball. That's all, That's it. It's over. And James O'Connor actually said he walked down the line about 10 seconds before this and he said Darrow Sullivan, the Bally Gunner manager, had his hands in his head, hands over his face. It was done. And then all of a sudden, James O'Connor is the one in that position. And like it's like Offaly against Kerry in 1982. When do you want to be ahead? Right at the very end. Maybe no other time. And that's exactly what Bally Gunner did. And Bally Hale Shamrocks have been waiting 10 months for a crack at them. And it's funny, the shoe is on the other foot now because Bally Gunner are favourites going in Sunday. Bally Gunner are the ones bringing the better form to the table, I'd yeah, say, as well. Yeah. And Joey Holden actually says here, it's silly and naive to say Bally Hale are flying. And they're, they're probably not flying, they're going fine, but expect them to be flying on Sunday. Well, within games, they've been great. And within games, they've been terrible. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and that's kind of been the case. They're, they've built up big leads, and they've let like Nace got back at them at one stage as well in the game. No, they? Nace, Nace were leading early doors. Yeah, Nace were behind the half time, and there's no way they should have been. They left behind about three, four, three, five right. in that first half. Uh, and so that's one team that got a good run on them, and Ballyhale were just about able to stem it back, and they took over in the second half. Kilmacud got a run on them in the Leinster final, they scored one seven without reply, which is really unheard of, really. Yeah. From an experienced team that. 
are usually able to stem the bleeding. Somebody goes down, somebody does something. They just weren't able to. And both probably ask questions of Ballyhale in terms of pace. And Bally Gunner will definitely ask questions about here in terms of pace. All right. OTBM live each morning with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Here's what's coming up between now and 10 o'clock. Uh, Ron McGarr is going to join us in 10 minutes' time. Kevin Caban's going to be live on the line from Qatar at 10 past 8. We've got Alan Quinlan at 8.35. Actor Simon Delaney and comedian Owen Coggan are going to join us at 8.55 for their take on the World Cup. And Meg Linehan from The Athletic at uh, half past 9. Dennis Ryan's been in touch to say the great Mick Verney, all is well with the world. Happy Christmas, everyone. And uh, Danny Mack is asking how stubborn are the GA with the fixture? I mean, look, um, they backed themselves into a corner and they didn't move. The thing is here, right, once you fix the fixture, you can't, like, you look, not that you look weak by changing it, but just fix it for another time. <laughs> it, it's not like we're going up against the World Cup. It, not, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's When you fix it for the same time, it's almost like they're not going to crawl back or change their view. I just think they could have probably went earlier. Like... I don't know. Like, would there have been an issue? Maybe there would be an issue with playing a game. You know, playing one game at half twelve and even playing the other potentially at two o'clock or something like that. The World Cup starts at is a ha- three. Okay, it's ninety minutes. At least you're given the last sixty minutes or whatever. Because listen, everybody wants to watch whether it's Messi or Mbappe and whether it's going to be Messi's crown crown a moment. That's just the way it is. Like, yeah. Um, the other big GA story is that we now know the details on how much it's going to cost to get GA go and also what games they have. So it's 79 quid if you buy it from January 1st. It's 59 between now and then. And they've got a good slate of games. Yeah, they do. Um, it's 59, I think, before the new year. I've already sent it to my sisters and said, listen, this might be a good Christmas present for me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, they've got a good slate of games. I think it's nine hurling uh, and the remainder are football, but a, a good few uh, Munster and Leinster round robin games. Um, listen, it, it does. It looks like it looks like a good deal, and they've got a brilliant lineup as well. To be fair, uh, Michael Murphy's obviously in there. Marco Shea, Seamus Hickey, uh, Grania McIlwain presenting. Um, it's interesting. That's kind of one of the Sky cohort moving somewhere, and obviously yeah. maybe the pundits maybe haven't kind of moved yet or been seen. Maybe we don't know what the the makeup of the the Sunday game team is going to be next year as well. So that's going to be fascinating over the next while. But I think Larry McCarthy said that will. It will kind of wash its face. They probably won't make money, but that they won't lose money. But um, yeah, look, looks like a pretty good setup. I have to say, it's better than you know buying the bulky deal is a lot better than paying ten or twelve quid per game or it's, something like that. It's going to be twelve per game, and you can get three for two, uh, or certainly twenty four, and you'll get three games for that. Um, but obviously, then what they're doing is they're incentivizing you to buy the big deal. So very interested to hear what people have to say about that. Whether or not they think it's a good deal, uh, you can get us in our comments. 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number or of course you can uh, leave a comment on the YouTube stream and you need to be subscribed uh, from next week if you want to leave a comment on the YouTube stream so just hit subscribe on that um, the other big story last night was the FAI's AGM was on and they were supposed to vote they were Neva Man he's going to be nominated to sit on the board the FAI are miles behind where they need to be when it comes to um, the gender balance on the board if by next year you don't have 40% female membership of your board you're not going to be entitled to state funding which is every all of the sports organisations have known about this um, for a long period of time they're not the only sports organisation in the country by any means who is struggling to meet that last night was supposed to be um, it was the uh, second attempt at an AGM. They had one in the summer. They didn't have enough women. And that was in, in person in the Manchester House. And they were like, oh, look, we'll move this. We won't ask everybody to come up and with the weather. It looked like a good idea. But then the technology failed and they couldn't actually have the vote. And um, there was a lot of Jackie Weavers in the comments um, about uh, on the Teams chat. The Teams chat was lit by all accounts. And so a lot of people were having their say at the AGM. And loads of people who you, who you might know. Um, board member Tom Brown has uh, reported in the 42 this morning. Still no email. Can you check what email address it was sent to? Grace McCauley Ryan. Up to 13 one-time passcodes and still not able to access. John Early. Made seven attempts. Ridiculous system. This is a shambles. What a waste, said Martin Connolly from Dundalk FC. Like trying to decipher the Da Vinci Code. You're <laughs> sitting there and you're like... The FAI board this is supposed to be like, oh, it's a good moment for us. No, yeah, we just qualified for the Women's World Cup. And then all of a sudden, the story comes out about Vera Powell, and you're like, oh, Jesus. And they still don't have a sponsor for the jersey. Now, they have said that the biggest commercial deal in the history of the organization is the new kit deal, but no details on that have emerged yet. So we don't know if that's because it's a 10 year deal, and so obviously it's going to be, or is it actually on a per money basis? Um, that was said after everybody couldn't sign in. Presume that needed to be a saving grace of I some d- kind. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's the bit you get out at the first. Because like, uh, um, 
Nixon Morton, uh, this process is totally discredited in the interest of democracy and fair play. This vote must be declared invalid and redone properly at a later date. So, uh, all a bit of... Um, uh, Martin Connolly, can you respond to something? <laughs> Roy, Jerry, step in here. This is a nonsense at Gary Keller of St. Pat's. Like, so, you know, it, uh, it obviously was not seamless. Uh, definitely not, no. Um, ah, listen, that's the. it's just the last thing they need. It's the last bit of PR they need as well. They don't need any of that at this moment in time. It's mad to think that they thought it was okay to fix it for a week before Christmas as well. You know, it was always going to be messy. Whatever about the roads and travel and things like that, time-wise it was always going to be messy. Surely early December or early New Year or whatever it is. I think, I, I think it's okay if it's going to be virtual and you tell everybody, like this, because it's supposed to just be a rubber stamp. Yeah. Laz, this is the crack, this is the crack, this is the crack. Uh, we we have somebody. Everybody's as kind of knows what the, it's like. Supposed to be straightforward, and then the technology fails. It surely should be in person at this stage, though. When we've been denied of that for so long, you go back that and you just build up those relationships again. And not not been smart. You've been in rooms where you know it's me and you here, and we're talking something. You've been in another room where it's you talking to me and whatever. Like, and I, you know, I take Can't this. Every, I take yeah. this every day of the week. Yeah, you need to. Like look into someone's eyes almost as well when you're making decisions or you know there's a trust and a loyalty thing as well to it as well particularly in uh, any sports organisation where we all know that there are little cliques and little factions and uh, and I'm not I'm not uh, holding the FAI alone in that, that that's, uh, oh, that's it's everywhere it's a GM like not been smart you're you just say I'm proposing something. You can see what people think by their eyes. Whereas in a laptop, you know, someone could be muted or the video could be turned off or whatever. When they're, when they're looking at their feet and you're like, oh, I, we talked about this earlier. <laughs> yeah, or you know, they were supposed to vote for you or something like that. Or they were supposed to second something, and then all of a sudden they went missing. Yeah, yeah. But give me that in person thing. Oh, you you know you know possible. much more about it. And uh, the other thing is, um, great piece from today, Kazan in your paper today. Uh, she's talking about um, body shaming and she has, like, she's... Um, so the Vera Pau thing, right? The FAI obviously came out fully in support of Vera Pau without saying... They did say that they're going to do a bit more uh, reading on it, but not really. Like, they've kind of... They've made their bed now and uh, it's very much in support of Vera Pau. And they went much further than I thought they would do um, without us actually having heard from Vera herself. If you remember, like, Vera Pau got lots of credit for immediately coming out after Ua Obdara to face down and do... She did every interview in the aftermath of that, like, every interview. But she hasn't done any yet. Now, as far as I know, she's going to be the manager of the year at the RT Sports Awards. That's the, the, the speculation. So, obviously, this is supposed to be the crowning week of the year, you know. Um... Ian Dempsey's doing a poll this morning. What's the best sports moment of the year? And it's Ireland qualifying for the World Cup. So you, know, you can understand why the FAI just want to ride the wave of that. Like, this is a really positive story and it's great. But um, Sinead Kassan is, uh, she's at it this morning. You should read it in the Irish Independent. There were a few suggestions on social media that the above claims are much ado about nothing. But any manager who tries to control, or who tries to body shame a player is another way of trying to control them when the balance of power is already with the manager. Body shaming prioritises stereotypes over the most suitable and healthy weight any individual should be allowed to perform at. She's got her own experience that she speaks about as an athlete at the start and then goes on to talk about um, uh, the Tyler Toland situation. It would also seem she demonstrated an abrasive side when dealing with teenager Tyler Toland and her exclusion from the national team a few years ago. Toland's father, Morris, told journalist Chris McNulty, Vera told Tyler she looked too leggy, that her legs had got 10 centimetres bigger since she moved to Manchester City and suggested she would pick up an ACL injury by the second week in November if she maintained the training she was doing. Sinead Kassan says then, if this is said with an in-depth knowledge of Toland's physiological makeup and an encouraging and supporting environment for a teenager, that's one thing. If this is said in an off-the-cuff manner which could undermine, belittle and damage a player's confidence, that's another. And here's the thing, the FAI needs to just make sure that uh, it's, not the, it's not the controlling, that it's actually um, encouraging because um, we haven't seen Tyler Toland since, you know, and that's like, um, we, we don't as a country have resources where players can be like, you know, cast aside because they don't fit some preordained notion. We have to work with those players, encourage them and get them to a position where they're able to uh, represent us on the international stage. Yeah, whatever resources we have, we have to carefully mind them and make sure that we, you know, even if it's a longer term with someone and you've given them a bit of time away to, you know, do whatever they need to do, you need to, you need to be making sure we're not casting anybody aside you know this uh, just kind of <laughs> you know that scene in Casino Robert De Niro's character where he's like weigh weighing the dancers and all this kind of thing <laughs> like you know this, it's just it, you need to be so careful 
uh, particularly like nowadays uh, I, was only, I only watched back on the RT player there recently the the documentary they did about uh, you know some men with different dis- eating disorders which is not you know something that's generally not spoken about and inside the mind of somebody like that like if, if, if you've any like preconceived notion of like watching your food or anything like that comments can be so damning and it just flies through your head and it just doesn't go away whereas like you know, some people would just look at food and they just eat it or whatever. Other people are looking at the effects it's going to have on them. So you have to be so careful uh, with regards to how you um, converse with people on topics like this. Yeah, so we, we do expect to hear from Vera Pau over the next uh, 24, 48 hours or so. And it's important she comes out and addresses it because I, I do think that if she came out and said, yeah, I, I did wrong then, I've learned a lot from it, I've taken on board some of the criticism, I'm going to change, everybody would be like, okay, that's fair enough. Whereas actually, by saying nothing and by, by like maybe the FAI have done the right thing, they're like, no, 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 it's, it's totally fine. What are you talking about? They did say this is historical. It's 2018. Like, yeah. I mean, 2018 does not feel historical to me. It feels very, like, recent. Yeah, well, as, as well as that, if she came out and said something like that, like, you've probably been involved with different things where your opinion of something four years ago change, has changed completely and you're like... I often think about when I was managing and coaching what I would have done 10 years ago compared to what I do now completely different like I remember making I, we got beaten in a match one time I was over the under 21s and you know, I think I called all the lads failures or something like that this, like it, that's just what I thought was good for motivating them at the time and listen it worked because we <laughs> went back through the back door and ended up getting to a county final but like would I ever dream of saying anything like that now no way so your mindset and your views on things changes so much so I think if she were to come out and you know explain that you know mea culpa yeah and my views on this has changed completely in the you know the four years since yeah we need something all right so we'll keep an eye on the Vera Powell situation at uh, seven fifty two this morning though we're saying good morning to Ronan O'Gar Ronan good morning to you how are you Jar good I had the sniffles like you a few days ago but I've beaten it within forty eight hours so I'm quite happy that I'm not using boxes of tissues for the last. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a few days. I was hoping nobody'd seen that, Ronan. But thanks very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can hear it very, very succinctly in your voice. It's all Thank over you. the place. It's general all over Ireland at the moment. Um, but uh, so the this is like from a how, first off, how the hell did you beat it in forty eight hours? And secondly, the French team, the rugby, the footballers apparently have a virus ripping through them at the moment. So this is obviously something that like we're kind of people missing work. They're coming in breathing over each other. But for you, you could have suddenly half a team gone. Yeah, but I suppose once we've had COVID um, experience, sure, everything is easy now. Fair enough. <laughs> in, term, in terms of flus, in terms of illness, in terms of obviously when it comes to, um, you know, I mean, because one in 70, whatever, so there's always going to be the, the really uh, sad illnesses that we uh, struggle to find cures for, like Daddy Weir or Ed Slater or. And then there's uh, less, I suppose, um, serious illnesses and the fact, but like once colds and flus and stuff, uh, there's a great show. The show goes on, you're, you're not missed. No. no matter who you are as a player uh, or as a coach, everyone is very replaceable. It, it, it rolls. The monster keeps rolling. And I firmly believe that. I just think that... Sometimes, whether you're the coach or you're a player, they put a huge value on them. But, um, you know, I think, as uh, I remember that when with Munster playing, uh, you know I mean, our best player, Paul O'Connell, was was um, was out for the whole European, uh, I think, in 06 or 08. Uh, uh, it would have been 08, I think. Uh, he missed all the pool stages and we won six out of six, you know, while just listening to the mindset discussion before like we would have said oh no we're in trouble here but if you change it a little bit and tweak it a little bit um so the show goes on put someone in there fill him with confidence and he can do the job you know so um with uh yeah flus and colds um you know unless it's something sinister usually i suppose with the metabolisms of sports people they can they can knock it quicker uh, it's interesting you talk about the mindset, right? Because I was thinking um, this week, obviously, you're, you're playing Ulster. Uh, I don't know if you're an NFL fan or not, but the Dallas Cowboys played uh, the Houston Texans last week. The previous week, 
Dallas had scored 50 and Houston are literally the worst team in the NFL at the moment and so everybody had just kind of blah 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 that's going to be a win for them it's going to be really, really straightforward but uh, they, they needed a 98 yard drive in the last minute to win the game to squeak the win the Cowboys and okay good so there is a happy ending to, my, to the story that's yeah, to, but, to my weekend but the, the, <laughs> okay. the, the coach was saying before the match you know we've got two opponents this week uh, we've got Houston and the, the man in the mirror and then afterwards, everybody was like, well, you know, maybe uh, that was you were over egging the whole complacency thing too much. I don't know. I, so we, we know. So basically, I, I understand if you're complacent this week, the uh, it's a disaster. It, you just can't, you know, in rugby in particular. No, because it's such a fascinating topic. You know, the, the I suppose the big difference between good and great players is just here. Uh, but you have to multiply that by 23. And some people... Um, prepare differently and after a victory are different but I would say complacency is, is way too strong there's a difference between complacent and on, on edge and how you can find that balance for me is where you become consistently good and I haven't found it because we have shown glimpses of world class uh, moments for seconds and then absolute division three stuff and you're like oh come on boys let's Let's try and get a uh, get a little bit more consistent in what we're doing because you know it's obviously very nicely scripted this weekend. Ulster take thirty nine points and sail nil for the first time. There's a monster coach bringing over a French team. French teams are brittle, but um, you know that's not us. So I think what's been good this week is that we're aware of that Ulster will be at their best and will be different. But I think if we're at our best, I think. Um, we hopefully have have enough for them. Ronan, it's not your job to like keep the players like level, I suppose, and focus. But uh, you want that to be inherently in them, and you want them to you know not let complacency slip in or anything like that, and keep their you know keep the the train on the track, shall we say? But as a manager, do you have any sounding board that you use to make sure that you don't dip at all? If you get me, because you're the one that's yeah. steering the ship. Yeah, I do exactly. I, I and it's 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 the most important because you I mean whoever the leader is in any organisation and there essentially is only one because if he doesn't jump out, then it's not clear who the leader is. So, yeah, when you're like the managing of energy is very important for me, and I'm and I'm I'm seeing that because I'm probably trying to have a look at how I can structure my week better because we play Saturday night with a with the focal point of I suppose how we're judged. Then Sunday is review, Monday is review preview, Tuesday is execute, and by Tuesday lunchtime, essentially you're just call, calling out for the bed or the coach or um, something to help you because uh, from um, Tuesday lunchtime, Wednesday you can come up for air for the first time, but you're kind of on a little bit of edge. Friday with captains run, Saturday is game day, so there's nervous energy there. Sunday, you're your wife, but your video and, 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 and analyzing everything. Monday, you're looking at what you need to keep and remove and have a look at the opposition. Then Tuesday, you're trying to do that with, well, in our case, the same group really for the first time this season after 12 league games because we always change the team for the league game. But for Europe, you don't. You kind of go as strong as you can to a certain point without risking injuries. Um, but yeah, like we'd have a a mental skills coach for, for the group, for me. Um, but it's uh, it's an area definitely that, um, that I'm looking into because I think um, there may be a better way of doing my week. What do you do with the mental skills coach? Uh, so you kind of, I suppose, make a plan for, for my preparation, for the team's preparation, for his preparation. And... Then, I suppose, strip it back and kind of go, okay, so the uh, person who's the weakest at taking in information in this group, how can we present to them? And remember, Joe, you're, you're doing it in French and English, so essentially rugby for dummies. Uh, but like that for me is how you become good because if you can explain it and the person can tell you back, what I have just explained to him, 
then we're in a good place to start. Then we go on to the pitch and have a look to see what we're saying. Does it make sense on the pitch? And then we review it. And then hopefully repetitions one to four, we make errors. Four to eight, we get a bit of speed in it. And hopefully by eight to ten, we can score tries at the weekend from it. Um, and then with that, you have um, obviously... Um, how, how they feel, you know what I mean? If I think the move is good, that's really not too interesting for them because they're the guys essentially pulling the trigger with the ball. Um, but there is, I suppose, a lot of moving pieces quickly and everyone thinks you have a lot of time in the week, but there's enough time to get, I suppose, what you prioritise because we can't prioritise everything and um, just in different languages, it, it's... it's, it's um, it's frustrating yet hugely rewarding. So, uh, the bit that you're doing with the mental skills coach for yourself is like a kind of trial conversation about the message that you want to deliver while at the same time uh, asking if you're managing your own time correctly. So, there's a kind of twin. Yeah, no, like I suppose the bigger picture, Joe, would be there is that so early in a project, I feel you, you cheat a lot of steps to go to Marseille to win a European Cup, yet when you strip it back and analyse, you understand that uh, a lot of that was built on sand. That isn't a good recipe, you know? So I think once you realise that you got lucky, but maybe the plan was good, but you have to have really strong fundamentals. And uh, there wouldn't be really strong fundamentals in the club yet, but that's something that... I hope my legacy will be. So that's very important to me that there are building blocks put in place to make sure that we can progress. Because what has happened in the past is that uh, auto-delete was very evident in players' minds. So play the game and by Sunday night, wipe. And you're like, OK, well, I thought we saw that last week. Oh, no, OK, we need to rep that again today. <laughs> we need to rep that again today. We need to rep that again today. Uh, but how do we grow? Uh, uh, and then you don't want to make them feel robotic. You don't want to make it feel like it's a job. You want them to laugh. You want them to have fun. You want them to come into a building where it doesn't feel like work. So uh, you got to understand, too, that you mean from... Irish people are very similar, but you come to a French club and you've Africans, you've Georgians, you've uh, Fijians, Samoans, Tongans, French, Australians, South Africans, all nationalities of the world where they, their humour is very different to our humour and how they see the world is very different. But that's not to say theirs is better or ours is better, but you got to accommodate that and you got to, I suppose, understand that and mixing that all into the melting pot it becomes... Uh, a fascinating um, environment and uh, you want this place in, in, in La Rochelle to be uh, a place where boys want to come and they can express themselves. We've Raymond Rule who dances around, Teddy Tama who thinks he's a DJ. We have a lot of this, but if they're good at rugby too, but let them be who they are as opposed to coming in and um, thinking it's a school environment. That, that That's not my gig. Because Michael was talking about his under under twenty one team, where he called them failures and uh, and and learning, you know, going on. That. <laughs> I, I'd love to hear that real story over a pint. I think that could take forty five minutes. And yeah, there's there's a bit I, in it, all right, uh, definitely. Uh, just on that as well about dealing with different personalities. Uh, like no matter what you say, like it's not a one for all job. Like everybody is different, and you can't treat everybody the same. Would I be right in saying? Because if you treat everybody the same, then you're basically looking for the, all the same type of characters within a team and you won't win anything with all the same type of characters, really. You need, you know, you need to be dipping in, taking different pieces from, you know what I mean? Like, is, would, I be right, yeah. would I be right in saying that? Yeah, I, I, and, yeah, not to cut across you, but for me, I would flip it on its head and I'd go, everyone is different. So for me, there is n there's not two people the same in a group of 40. And for me, that's very, very important in, in how I go about. So people are understanding what's the program for the group and, and they're kind of looking at me, what is this guy on about? Where's the program? Where, where, why haven't I received the planning? Because every single person, even though it's a team sport, 
is completely different, is managed completely different. There's no, this group are doing this because everyone's minutes are different. Everyone's injury profile is different. Everyone's, you know, rest, sleeping patterns, um, capacity to, you know, I mean, some guys uh, need to keep their weight up. Some guys need to lose. Every single person is different. So for me, that was one thing uh, that I've realized since I became, I suppose, the manager that, uh there's there's no none of this groups of yeah these guys do that that and that every single one of the 40 and as important as will skelton is he's as important as my third choice hooker when you're talking about um stuff being built on sand and trying to get the fundamentals right you, you kind of reached it seems first for playing style and, and making sure that um, and then that, that evolved into making sure they have fun as well so what you're talking about really is like four or five key pillars where the environment is correct the culture is correct but then if, if it's not to be built on sand your recruitment has to be amazing like that's the the key part that ultimately you're only going to be as good as the players you recruit and everything kind of everything is a little bit of everything yeah no I challenge you there Ger. I think the academy is more important than the recruitment that was the strength of Munster. Local boys with quality imports, Jim Williams, John Langford, Howlett, uh, Topoki, these guys, but built around uh, 12 really, really good players from Munster. It's the same for what you're trying to do here, but it's harder now because we probably, uh, I'll give you the example, in the 12 position, we'd have uh, Jonathan Dante, 12 for France, Lavinia Bhatia, 12, captain of Fiji, and then probably Jules Favre in the training group for France. So that's 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 a high standard. So but a young guy can't see the route for him to progress. And he's right, but you have to try and explain to him that if he gets... I suppose his first two years right in the academy and his passing game and his body is in in, in top nick. There's a there's uh, a route for him, but you can't cheat the early years. You've got to get in those, um, as you say, fundamentals into the player. But what's more important than that is you have to have the fundamentals in the in the in the environment and uh, the pitch. For me, is easy, Ger. It's 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 the um, it's the person before that. What kind of people are you looking to get into the building to work with uh, before you even even approach the tactical side of the game? So the academy is obviously a pillar as well. It is, but it's a pillar with uh, 20 years behind the Leinster uh, Academy, for example, you know? Yeah. But that's okay too. This is, this is, only, this is only starting, you know? Uh, I suppose what is really exciting about the French competition is that um, the top 14 has such history and prestige that uh, there's a huge uh, incentive for every single club to win it, supported by whatever, over 70 million people. So that buzz will always be there. There's most definitely, I suppose, with the new format, question marks over Europe and the... Um, the new, I suppose, format is that going to appeal to the French people? I'm not too sure. Yeah, the new format. Um, we can talk about that again some other time. I did want to bring up one last thing in the paper this morning. You're talking about your uh, dream scenario of penalty takers. Myself and Michael were having a bit of a debate about. So uh, you you went with Farrell last, right? And uh, and you you picked yourself third. No, no, I didn't. Well, I was hoping I didn't. I wasn't meant to pick myself because that's well, you, were, the you left it. You left it like, oh, I'm looking for somebody to fill fill in third. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I just well, I suppose the Neymar situation, isn't it? Like, why does he wait till last? You know. Well, yeah. In my in my in my in my thinking, so it was Neil Jenkins, I think, to kick it off. Then you can put Dan Carter either side. Um. I can kick. Who was fourth? Johnny Wilkinson was second. So Johnny Car Wilkinson. Car Carter must have been fourth. So I was just interested that you picked yourself third, though. Uh, you know, uh, like <laughs> that's the pressure one. That's the key one. Fucking <laughs> damn right it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we love, Joe. That's placed ball. I just, uh, I just, uh, um, you know, 
unfortunately, the World Cup has been so good in soccer, but it, it shouldn't be because of where it was played. But like the big focus has been on the, as we started the conversation with the the the, the, the top few inches of the head, because um, for me, it says so much about uh, the character when it becomes to the, uh, a close skill. Yeah. But it, 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 I thought it was really, I thought it was interesting. You, uh, you, when you got the chance to pick, went third, right? Neymar, when he got the chance to pick, went fifth. When it didn't matter in the end, turns out maybe the third one is the is the pivotal one because that gives everybody you're still in it. You, you know, your chance. Or is the first one the pivotal one? Like you, it's the same as. You mean how many teams that? Um, you mean that score the first or missed the first go on to win. I presume the odds are completely reduced. So you need you need a guy with big balls showing the way. I mean, it turns out then this isn't a, a, there's no answer to this. Come here, where's the game going to be tomorrow? Do you know? No, we don't know. We're waiting for a decision. Um, hopefully by two o'clock we're due to fly. But I think for whatever reason we have to go into Belfast, which... But... The bus journey to to um, to the RDS may compensate the fact that it's not in uh, the Kingspan <laughs> if if that's how it plays out. <laughs> so don't feel too sorry for us if it's in the RDS, but I presume it's in the Kingspan. All the Leinster fans coming out to, to uh, cheer La Rochelle. Is that what you that that's going to happen? Well, yeah, and the good news too that there's a direct flight from from Cork to La Rochelle since yesterday so we need to celebrate that as well were, so, you, we, 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 were you personally involved in that like lobbying hard <laughs> no. Uh, no no I wasn't because there's an up and a downside to that that means there's more people to host <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to say that bit on air <laughs> Ronan good stuff enjoy the weekend cheers cheers you too good cheers luck. lads thanks bye 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 <laughs> La Rochelle's great. I don't know if you've been. Never been. I uh, tell you what's fascinating. I love how, like Ronan would say himself there, he went from like running away from pressure almost to like loving pressure, to thriving on pressure. And that's, I, I'd love to chat him even more about, about that even and how he passes his own experience on to players because like you're kind of raw enough and naive enough until something happens in your career like happened with him when he missed all the kicks in the, in the cup final and then all of a sudden you go back into your shell but then he was able to deal with it build himself up and now you know give me that pressure hand it to me I you know I thrive on it now and I think that's fascinating um, where do you want to take a penalty if you're like the if you are the place kicker or if you are the free taker Oh, you're number one, I think, yeah. Do you? I think you set the tone, yeah. Right. Yeah, if you, you're number... Like, I put it to you this way. If there's a penalty in a match, you're the one that's taking it, so you're going to be the first up. So yeah. I think you should be first up. You should definitely be definitely be making sure that you're getting a penalty. And, well, I mean, and not that, fifth. That's why I think the third one is, is quite pivotal, because you're still guaranteed to be in it no matter what has happened up to that point. So if, if two people have missed you can't lose the penalty shootout on the third penalty. You can keep your team in it when the pressure's at its absolute most. Yeah, the the first one sets the tone, but it's not potentially a knockout penalty. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I get you. Yeah, no, I get you. It's just, it's gas to think Well, it's just, he picked himself third. That was interesting, I thought. You know. Yeah, yeah he didn't seem to, he didn't seem to think, he thought the first one was uh, the know, most yeah, important. Like but <laughs> I do think that the third one is kind of like, are you going to go through or are you not going to go through? Putting yourself down five and the potential to not take a kick. Yeah, I, I, I'll never get my head around that one. I was going to say, we won't bring this up with Kevin Caban, given uh, history, but actually we will. We will, because he's up next. It's 8.14. Uh, during the ad break, you're going to hear a clip from the OTB Games Room with Eric Donovan in partnership with Virgin Media. Bring your A game with 99.9% broadband reliability. Kev in Qatar, next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Who is this serving and what is the end goal would be kind of nice to know. The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports. I feel like we haven't had quite enough Irish bias this year, so I am quite happy to see this. Yeah. They were awesome. It's true what Emma Carroll said. Liverpool are coming into their own, right? Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. 
You're welcome to the OTB Games Room in partnership with Virgin Media. Bring your A game with 99% broadband reliability. So we have our first leaderboard. It's very simple in these games of FIFA. You want to score lots of goals, and Adrian Barry did just that. He tops the leaderboard from our little OTB session. So basically, first up, you want to score, then it's goal difference. So you want to win as well, and then we'll work our way down through the various tiebreakers. But basically, right now, Eric Donovan, our next guest, Adrian Barry has set a high target, three goals to nil. You picked Real Madrid. I, as always, am the champs, Shamrock Rovers. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar Right, 16 minutes past 8 Time for us to head to uh, Qatar For the last time, I think With uh, Kev Kevin Caban Good morning to you Oh, he's back on Monday, obviously But how are you? Good morning, Jay I don't, I don't, I don't normally get you on Friday what, what, What's happening here? Well, um, the the school show is on today And so I had to switch with Adrian Barry And it suited him Ah. So yeah, uh, well, yeah every, every, everything's got to suit Adrian, hasn't it? Between ten thirty and two o'clock today, I'll be watching the same set of carols being sung by five different classes. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> it's got to be done. It has to be done. It it absolutely <laughs> it absolutely has to be done. And apparently, you're not allowed to bring a hip flask. It's frowned upon. Oh really? Is that right? Yeah, I don't know. It's the only thing. It's the only thing. That, look, it's great. They're 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 all excellent, and they've all been working really hard for uh, a long period of time, and I'm very excited about they're it. Controlling the control buttons, they're just focus on the process. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're showing up. You can't you can't contain your emotions right now, then, eh? No. Um, right. So look, we have we we had some quick fire stuff that we wanted to uh, get through, and then I do want to talk to you about some trends and any lessons for Ireland from uh, what we've seen over the last while. So, best player of the tournament, outside the obvious. Obviously, outside Messi and um, Sorry, and best, Mbappe, be, then we're looking at our best goal was the first one, not best player. I misread it. Best goal, yeah. You've gone for Chavez. Best goal. I mean, do you know what the, the, the reason why I went for Chavez was technically as 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 a free kick. It's one of the best free kicks you'll you'll, you'll see, and uh, I love a free kick. But I've heard I've heard some of you guys been on over the last week or so that their free kick doesn't count, but technically unbelievable goal and you know you've got the, the probably if I, if I really think about it the goal for one moment which could have been a great moment the Neymar goal against Croatia in oh, that yeah. quarter final as a team goal was just unbelievable even the Vegas goal late on against um, against Argentina the way that, that that came about for one moment unbelievable Sterling's goal Abubakar's chip but Abubakar's scoop he would never ever have done that even the Richarlison's one um Richarlison's one was it, it wasn't a great touch and he had to sort his feet out so to finish it was a great finish and I'm not can't take anything away on that moment that stage but I think technically um, Chavez free kick was was absolutely perfect um, I, I think a free kick counts by the way I think you're it's it's a Joe who uh, has the yeah, of course it's Joe isn't it you know do you know what Joe's like that was his theory I I think that like it actually counts more because it, you've you've got the uh, oh, this is a big moment. I'm thinking about this now. Everybody's watching, as opposed to right balls in the air. I need to do the thing that comes instinctively. So you've gone for Messi as player. Uh, the story, the final isn't written yet. Are we tempting fate, or does it? Yeah. Work? Um. Well, it, it, I think I, I don't. I don't think it tarnishes his legacy in any way, win or lose. I don't think that that's going to be the thing. But um, I. I genuinely hope he does win. I think most football fans hope he does win just for, for everything that he's given us over the last 15, 20 years. If it's his last game playing for Argentina, then so be it. I think, I think certainly he can retire happy, can't, can't he, off the back of a, of a big win. But um, I, I think man for man, French are, the French are a better side. And I think I just think France are going to win the game, Jerry. I just look, look at the side. and I mean, I was listening to you just before, actually, when you were talking to Ron O'Gara. There's, there's a virus running through the side. Um, that that could that could be a key a key thing with it. If they're not fully fit, they're not right. That, that could be that could play into Argentina's hands. But um, if you'd have to say honestly, I'd say the player of the tournament is Messi, just what he's done single handedly. But 
Antoine Griezmann has to be right up there with him. Antoine Griezmann, every single game from the first game against Australia has been, he's just been brilliant every single match he's played in. So I think Griezmann certainly can give Mbappe and um, and uh, Messi a run for the money. Can I just ask you quick, quickly about Griezmann, Kev? Uh, he's kind of reinvented himself, would it be fair to say? Like he's playing a completely yeah. different role now and he, he's back clearing balls off the line. He's, you know, orchestrating more than finishing now. It's fascinating how, uh, I suppose, is that because of the surplus of attacking players that they had that they needed and maybe a deficit in the middle of the park that they needed someone who was going to create maybe more than they had the finishers already? Yeah, I, I, do you know what, Michael, as well? Maybe a little bit of... He's got to compensate a little bit for uh, for Mbappe. Mbappe's work rate of getting back into the side, it, it's not always going to be there. So Mbappe, seen, sorry, Griezmann seems to be doing a bit of the work for for uh, for Mbappe. He's playing as a ten, although you'll see him in in the six role at times. He'll be sat in front of the back four. He'll be taking the ball off the defenders. He'll be he'll be trying to almost dictate the run of play and. Uh, dictate the tempo of a game so you'll see him working back you'll see him clearing balls out of the 18 yard box and you'll see him then sprinting forward to get on the end of things so I think creativity wise I mean the, the first goal um, that France scored the other night against, uh, against Morocco if, if you watch it from the, from the tactical cam and you see his movement in the build up to that goal and when France was shifting the ball from left to right and coming back on itself so he must have made about four or five different runs just little runs and one little subtle movement opened up Morocco because it just left too big a gap between the, the, the left wing back and the left centre half. The ball was then easily slotted down the outside and the game just opened up in that one movement and um, in that one moment, shall I say. So it's it's so it's so um it's such fine margins when you get to, you know, that type of game, that semi final like it was, because Morocco weren't really gonna shift, they weren't really gonna budge and it was Griezmann that opened up the game with just movement. It wasn't necessarily being on the ball that actually that, that actually created that goal. So I think the cleverness of his runs, you say, reinventing himself. I, I just think, honestly, I just think he's had a, a, an unbelievable desire to be involved in everything that, that France have done. And I think that's basically been the key to it. Playing as a 10, I think, has helped him. We've seen him play off the right-hand side for France and Atletico and Barcelona and things over the years. I just think the number 10 role suits him because he's literally been instrumental in everything that, that France have done. Yeah, and Deschamps has to get some of the credit here. Like, when you think back to how he turned Pogba into somebody who was completely consistent, very reliable, did exactly yeah. what he was supposed to do, 100% a team player four years ago, then all of a sudden his first choice centre midfield gets ripped out because of injury, and it's like, no, I can fix this, no problems. And Griezmann's going to yeah, be my I solution. Think that, like, I think, I, do you know what, Jerry? I think that's exactly what it is as well. Like, um, Sh- Shumeni that's been playing and doing, he's doing well, I have to say that, he's doing well, but He's not nowhere near on the level of of, of Kante. When you watch the, the when you watch what Kante brought to that French side, he's not at that level. I don't think you know. I don't think he's great on the ball. I think that's going to improve with, with time when he's playing at, at Real Madrid as well. But Griezmann, has, I, I think he's probably just taken that responsibility. I think he's thirty one now. Maybe he, there could be a feeling within him: this is my last real chance of, of a World Cup. And and it's now or never with him. And uh, I think this has definitely been Griezmann's best tournament. He was brilliant at 2016 in, in the Euros, but I think he's taken his game onto a new level here. Uh, so, a most underwhelming player of the tournament? Uh, oh, that has to be Kevin De Bruyne, doesn't it? Um, I think Belgium so 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 underwhelming as a, as a team coming into the tournament. Everyone talking about this being the last chance, but. With De Bruyne in the side, I think everybody just thinks, well, something could happen. They, they might do something special in, in in any game. And I watched them. I watched them live against uh, against uh, Canada in the first game, and he just he, he just wasn't himself. Now, obviously, clearly it, there's been issues within that camp. Clearly, there's something wrong. But um, watching Kevin De Bruyne, I think it was probably the worst performance I've ever seen him have. Watching him live. Um, I mean, he might not necessarily say that himself, but I, I, I just was watching him giving the ball away. I was watching his first touch wasn't quite right. He just he, mentally, he probably wasn't in the right headspace, and uh, that showed. So, it, 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 in my opinion, it would have to be De Bruyne. Yeah. Can he recover from that and play really well for City? Is it, is it going to be like a release back into the warm embrace of Pep Guardiola and everything's going to be fine, yeah. or is this just the natural arc of a footballer? You reach very high heights, and then at some point. You stop being as good as you were. He, he has to. He has to get back to the, the De Bruyne that we, we've seen, Joe, doesn't he? Because it, the level that he was at coming into the tournament was as good as he's been. So I, I, that was the, the, the most surprising thing. We were looking at it. He was still scoring. He was still creating this season. The relationship that he's got with Haaland, 
I, I just probably feel that there was something wrong. There was something wrong in that camp, and I don't necessarily see that he's reached a, reached a peak or anything at the moment. Because he's only thirty one. Like I'm, uh, you know, it's too early for me to be writing him off. Yeah, well, you already have. Yeah, maybe. there you go. Yeah, but I'm. Are you, are you, so, you're, so you're writing him off. So that's it. De Bruyne is I'm, gone. Is I'm that, rolling is that, back. Is that the headline? I'm rolling yeah. back. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> De Bruyne I've is learned. Gone, that's it. He's done. He's done. He's done. Then all right. He's no longer a failure. Uh, <laughs> your favorite match was um, Holland Argentina. Like it was. Uh, so Holland Argentina has obviously given us some incredible ends to matches. <laughs> you know, Dennis Bergkamp. Yeah. Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp. And uh, yeah. here we go again. Like it, you know, it couldn't possibly be better than that. And then it ends up being much better than that, even. Yeah, the the game. Let's be honest. Probably the first half was 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 crap, wasn't it? And even maybe sixty minutes, whatever it was. But I, I think that last twenty minutes of the game, or whatever it is, that will just take our judgment over everything. If you're looking at one individual match, it wasn't the greatest of games. But by God, that that last you you, you were literally on the end the edge of your seat when you were watching it. You were jumping down. You, the emotions throughout. It was such a great game to watch. It was amazing. Paddy Barkley got a grief on Twitter during the week, I think I'm fairly sure it was him, for saying um, everybody was calling for FIFA to let the game flow and now it's costing loads of really good players opportunities because of injury. Yeah. And uh, there's, a, there's a general shithousery is being accepted. Like, all the way through to Emmy Martinez basically saying the game is corrupt and not getting banned. I was amazed yeah. that they did nothing because Emmy Martinez, I don't know if you've seen the interview, right? But the interview was like, it was a really I great did, game. Yeah. Was, yeah, but like, you're, you know, you've just qualified and you were amazing. He's like, yeah, but I do want to talk about the referee and that shower over there. And I was like, this is yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> I know, but th- that, that happened a few times with referees. I mean, the referee standard up to maybe the quarterfinals was actually really good. There was no issues, no real issues. A couple of maybe issues with VAR earlier on. I think, you know, remember the Harry Maguire incident against, against Iran when it was clearly a penalty when he was getting wrestled to the ground and there was no pen given. And then they give Iran a penalty later on in that game. It was almost as if someone had spoke to VAR during running and said, look, you're going to have to sort this out. And they kind of corrected themselves and give a penalty for a shirt, tug, whatever it was. And everything went okay. There was a couple of decisions that VAR maybe called referees back that shouldn't have been. But by and large, it was okay. And then we hit the quarterfinals. And I'm sure the message to referees, I'm sure it probably comes from the top, as you say, let the games flow. Let's not be giving yellow cards out early. And... Um, and then all of a sudden, this the referees were a joke. The, some of the decisions they were they were doing, they, they'd lost control of games. But honestly, it was like a throwback. It was a spectacle in itself, watching all these players losing their heads. And then we got to the stage where, as you say, Martinez and a couple of players did interviews just to say that look, that referee should not be touching a game now. He should not be anywhere near it. So it's uh, it it was it was funny. It was funny watching the the progression of referees in this tournament and th- that went full circle making terrible decisions that were corrected almost in running. Then we came back to, to where we are now. So I think is it I think the Polish referee got the, got the final, I think, Joe, wasn't it? I think it's the Polish referee that's got the final. And I was surprised he got it because there was talk of the MLS ref getting it simply because he, he was a CONCACAF ref and they were quite pleased, I think, FIFA, the way that he was handling games. But I think it makes more sense to have the Polish ref who's refereed at a, a, a real elite level. I wouldn't want an MLS ref doing doing a chat, doing a, a World Cup final. So um, there'll be a bit of pressure on him. And will Argentina then be calling him out as a European ref? He's got bias towards France or whatever it will be. So it was a big call maybe by, by FIFA giving him the game. But uh, I'll see how that goes, John. I'm going to laugh and see what's going to happen with these um, Argentina Argentina lads because anything can happen with those guys. Um, you've, you've told us your prediction is, is France. It, it feels like France are a far superior team and under normal circumstances would be quite heavy favourites. In, in, in a little bit kind of similar to what it was against Croatia uh, four years ago. But anytime I say that to people, they keep making the case, yeah, but Argentina have actually got better game on game. They, they look much better. Yeah as the tournament has progressed. And that's a very powerful thing as well. Yeah, but Jay, I, I, honestly, if you, if you really watch the games, they haven't been great. And so many of the midfield players and, and just literally get, like passing the ball out of play. You know, we, we're doing the Island games, Jay, so often. And you're like looking at our midfield players and we're going like, take the ball. No one's taking the ball. They're not turning, they're not taking uh, across the shoulder. They're not switching play. And Argentina midfield players, DePaul and one or two others maybe in there, they're just making so many fundamental errors, giving the ball away, 
So, and everything's just relying on Messi just producing something. So, yes, they've got better as a team, but I just think they've become more solid as a team. I mean, Otamendi playing at the back for them. Who would have thought Nicolas Otamendi? We've seen him over the years being this rash defender, you know, getting tight with, with attacking players, getting caught out of position. And Otamendi's been brilliant. He's been outstanding throughout the tournament. So, I don't think they've got. I don't think they've got a great team. I don't think they've got great individual players. But they're coming together for maybe one goal, one purpose, or whatever you want to say. And yeah. if they if if they're going to win it, it, it'll be messy, won't it? From an Ireland perspective, uh, we obviously like to stick on our green glasses. Um, what's your instinct about the the countries that have put a plan in place, uh, adapted and adopted that plan? and are making progress. Are there lessons to be drawn from our perspective? Yeah, I, th- I think there are. Of course, there's, there'll be lessons. I'm sure Stephen Kenny will have a takeaway from this World Cup, and I'm sure he's, he, I mean, he's been over here, hasn't he? So he's been watching games. Um, I think everyone would maybe make comparisons of Morocco with us. Look, look what Morocco did. and, and, and look, But Morocco put a plan in place, I think it was 15 years ago now, 2007. I think they invested around $20 million into into. In, into a facility that was like a center of excellence we're, we're going to try and create we're going to try and put our best players into this into this academy and we're going to try and create something um what's the place in, in france called um, Clairefontaine. Clairefontaine. In a similar sort of thing to that from what i'm led to believe from what i read anyway i know most of the players are uh, are foreign born there's dutch born there's spanish born there's french born within that side and most of the best players are, are, are actually foreign born but at least they tried to get something in place. They tried to do something and I said a huge investment went into that and they tried to make some sort of excellence that's going to create the next group of players. But watching them, Jerry, I think there was a clear plan defensively, um, whether they were played four at the back or five at the back. But certainly when they played with four, I think they were so organised when they didn't have the ball. They had a way to defend deep, a low block, as, as Nathan likes to say. Um you know, he, he likes to get involved in the technical terms, Jay. You know what you know what Nathan's like. But um, he, um, he, you know, so they're playing from a low block. They're playing from a, from a system that's going to suit them, first of all. So they're going to get the defensive unit of the, of the side right. But the they're, they're fundamentals, get your fundamentals right when you don't have the ball. But you have to you have to find a way that you're going to open up sides. And with Amrabat in midfield, how he took the ball under pressure, how he would, he would try and thread passes straight through the middle of play. That, and, and you know when you make that pass through the middle... You get, you get, you break a line, as they say, another Nathan technical term. You break a line with your pass, and the game opens up. And they had a great way of playing out from deep line positions. They also had ball carriers, you know, Ziyech and um, Unani. I mean, Unani, this guy plays for Angers. They're, they're, I think, the bottom of the French league. This guy's going to be a superstar if, if, if we see the level that he's performed in this tournament and where, wherever he's going to go. But he's definitely going to leave Angers. The way that he could take the ball under pressure, the way that he could carry the ball in midfield. So, you know, like if you watch Luka Modric and watching that performance against Brazil, I'd say probably the, the performance of this World Cup because he had a bit of a nightmare in the game prior against Japan. He looked gassed. It looked like there was nothing left in the tank. And then he he won Croatia that game. He got Croatia through that match with with the level that he showed in, 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 the, in his performance. But if you watch what he does when he's on the ball, like he's not just... He's not just a player that, that plays two touch, one and two touch, get it, give it. He's a player that takes the ball under pressure. He can wriggle, wriggle away from, from, uh, from pressure that he's under. But he also drives forward 10, 20, 30 yards or whatever it is. And just by doing that, he opens up a game. And he does something that's a bit unconventional as well in how he receives the pass as well, Jer. So he, he, he runs beyond a player in an unconventional position of the pitch. Usually if it's a midfield player and say the fullback's got the ball, They'll drop away from play. Usually, as it is now, they'll drop into the back line, take the ball when um, when there's nobody near them. So they're trying to dictate the tempo. But what Modric does, he actually steps beyond the the attacking player. So usually it'll be a ten or a nine, whatever it will be that will that will drop back to to prevent the the holding midfielder getting on the ball. We saw it so often. You know, USA did it against Declan Rice. They they just dropped the two centre forwards back, and they kind of were on a little bit of a pivot to try to stop him getting on the ball. But what Modric does, he steps beyond that guy and he takes the ball beyond them. So again, that opens up the game further further forward. And I think there's little lessons like that for any young midfield player, maybe a coach that's coaching midfielders, that there's ways to get on the ball and not necessarily 
being, being a conventional footballer. And I think that's what Morocco did. Certainly with Amrabat, he did very similar things to what Modric did in taking the ball under pressure, but also stepping beyond uh, a, a, the opposition attacking plays to open up the game. And he's passing forward as well, which obviously opened up the game. So I think Morocco, Morocco are probably the natural one you'd look at to think, how have they done it? Yes, they've got players in the top levels and maybe we don't have players at, at the Moroccan level. But I think there's certainly a way that if we can get one or two players that, that that's raising the standard and playing at, at a higher level, um, I think there's certainly teams like Morocco, maybe some one or two of the other African side as well that certainly excelled and got out. Even the US, even the US. Like everyone was telling me, and I said to this, Jeff, everyone was telling me, that, oh, US, what a team. They're a great team. US are not a great team. They've got three very, very good midfielders. They're bang average at the back. They've got an average goalkeeper. And then up front, the bang average as well. Pulisic runs around a lot, but he doesn't, he doesn't create an awful lot. They don't create a lot of chances, but they've got three top-class midfielders. And that's, that's the thing that they had and in McKenney, in, in Musa, and of course, uh, Tyler Adams. And that's what got the USA through the tournament. That's what got them to the last 16. So I think there's certain lessons that we can learn from a lot of sides, yeah. Um Obviously, our, our next game is going to be against France, who are potential double World Cup champions. Um, and uh, the group uh, looks a little tricky. The uh, Dutch yeah. also looking pretty good, uh, which means that the referendum on Stephen Kennedy continues. And we're, we're perpetually stuck in this cycle of conversation about that, as opposed to holding the FAI to account for all the rest of the stuff where they couldn't organise an, an, uh, an AGM last night, where the voting... That it didn't work, you know. They, they, yeah, I, I read a little bit about it, so I'll have to read more on it today. But I did, I did see a few things on Twitter and things like that around it, though, Joe. Yeah. Um, have you have you thoughts about the successful countries and what they're doing? Um, I, I get I, well. What I would say, certainly, uh, say if you're looking at the top coaching wise with um, with Morocco, the coach Ali Hodjic gets into the tournament and then they sack him because he's not bringing the best player into the side um, in ZX. So. Obviously, um, Rodragi comes in and he basically only gets the job because he's bringing Ziyech into the squad. So that's not necessarily a good thing, really. It's not a good look from, from Morocco. But what I would say is they've found a way to get the best players into the side. That's what the fans want to see. They want to see the best players at the tournament. So that has got to be you know, a prerequisite for, for everyone. You've got to play your best players. You've got to have them because that's what that's what everybody wants to see. Um but I think certainly if you're looking at it from from the the technical aspect and, and what coaches are doing and, and what we're doing, as much as, of course, the results haven't gone right for, for, for Stephen Kenny. And, and I think, by and large, a lot of the performance haven't, haven't been great. But... I think I think it has been I think there has been a progression there. I think that I think it's a steady progression. Um, everyone's looking to quickly call out Stephen and the good luck. You know, we, we you know things didn't go well particularly great in the Malta and Norway games recently, and everyone's like saying, "Oh, we've gone backwards again now." But we we have to look forward. We have to look beyond just saying, "Look, let's go and pluck a Trapattoni out again. Let's go and get a, a coach that doesn't got a clue about our game." Has never watched a League of Ireland game. Has never, never even studied the structure of Irish football. And we're going to go and pluck a coach out of nowhere. And we're probably going to go back ten years. Yeah, we might qualify for a tournament. He might get us over the line. But our, our the whole of our game, the whole of our system is centered around the, the men's senior team. That's the way that it, that's the way that it has been. And that can never be the case. Where is our structure for producing the next player? Robbie Keane, Damien Duff, whoever, Roy Keane, whoever it's going to be. Where is our structure? We can't automatically just solely become focused on going, right, where's our next player that was born in England that, that's going to come and play for Ireland? That, that cannot be the case. We, we, we've gone from those days now. We've got to centre our our development or our whole programme on developing players, certainly from within. If somebody becomes available and they want to come and play for Ireland and they're English born, great. But we don't need to go searching for those guys. We don't need to go telling someone, ah, you're Irish, come and play for us. They've got to... I feel they've got to have a feeling to want to come and play for us, first of all. Yes, they might not necessarily be the, in, the, in, the, in an England squad or a Scotland squad at 23, 24. But that cannot be, that cannot be, sorry, it's not the phone down there. I'm getting a bit um, annoyed here. But anyway, but that, 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 that cannot be the whole, the whole purpose of our international side, you know, going elsewhere to look for players. We've got to find a way to start producing our own players that, yeah, we have to bump them up the ladder. We've got to get them into better leagues, into better teams. Their exposure to better, better players day to day has got to be, has got to be better because we, we we're not going to be able to have a, a, a better side further down the line. But we can't be just saying we're going to go and pluck somebody out of out of an academy 
in in Brighton or Man United or Liverpool, wherever it is, at 16, because you know they've got a chance to come and play for us. When we know full well that down the line they're probably going to turn the back. They're using us just to put themselves on a on a different on a different platform. So I'm not. I, I could never could never agree with that sort of mindset anyway. I think we we have to have a system in place, and I think in general we are starting to do that. It looks to me like there's there is a plan. There, like albeit it's baby steps at the moment, and maybe maybe people can't see that. But I think there is a plan. There's a structure in place that we've got a succession plan now going forward, and we've got. Look, if Stephen Kenny fails in in the in the next Euros and you know, we don't qualify, whatever it would be. I think he knows himself. He's not going to be around for the World Cup campaign in, in four years' time. But I do think that we can't go saying then, let's go and get a coach, let's pluck a coach out of nowhere that doesn't necessarily have a background in our game. I'm not saying it's an Irishman. I'm not saying, look, let's go and get an Irishman. But they've got to have an understanding of what our game is all about before before they're given the job. That, that That's what I believe in and that's what I think it should be. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you feel this uh, at the World Cup like that, you know, you've probably taught this before, but you're literally immersed in the best football teams and football uh, countries. And your takeaway is that actually, if we focus ourselves on our own systems and stop looking outside for some miracle messiah, that actually uh, we might begin to make progress that's sustainable and like long term yeah. sustainable. And we'll have a football culture yeah. that leads towards hopefully success. Yeah, but Jay, I, I've I've seen it so much, and you've probably seen it as well. That you know, narrative around different like like Twitter feeds and and whatever. Oh Jesus! Imagine if imagine if um, if if we had all these English players playing for Ireland that are all el- eligible to play for Ireland. What our team would be like? I think Jude Bellingham's eligible. I think obviously Declan Rice, uh, uh, Jack Grealish, Harry Kane, all these guys. Like, w- why are we centred solely? That's our, that's our that's our maybe it's been ingrained in us since Big Jack's days and all that sort of thing. And I, I supported the team. That was that was my era of supporting the team. I, I was on board with everything Big Jack was doing. And, you know, they brought me my, my own personal memories. But but we understand that we, we were burned by, by Declan Rice in a big way and even maybe Jack Grealish to an extent, but more Declan Rice who, who came in and used our system to get where he naturally wanted to be in his career. And, I, we can't be having that again. It, it, it probably will happen to us again somewhere down the line, but we cannot be solely focused on going into an academy overseas just to get a player that's Irish, el- that's eligible to come and play for us, knowing full well that that player might not necessarily even go and play in a senior team. It's just, it, it seems wrong to me. It, 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 it is wrong to me. And I, I, I don't want that to be the, the narrative around our squad solely looking at other nations to go, this is, they could have played for us. He, he's eligible to play for us. I don't. I don't see it as that. We've got to. We've got to get our own house in order before we go look elsewhere. Kev, great stuff as always. Thanks a million. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Enjoy the final. Talk to you soon. It's uh, Kevin Caban giving us a thought. Starts eight forty-two this morning. I thought that was fascinating. It's kind of like what Roger was saying earlier. That mentality is built on sand. We might get this guy or whatever. It's a, it's, a, it's almost like the GA. Oh, imagine if we had whoever. If he wasn't injured, like that's yeah, what yeah. it is. Like, yeah. and that's. Work with what you have. Try and build what you have, and make sure what's coming through the conveyor belt. Make it as strong as we possibly can. Uh, make the academies as strong as we can. And you know, if we get somebody like that, great. But that can't be your foundation. No, hundred percent. Uh, right. A couple of quick comments. Mick looks like the Mick looks like the lost member of the Libertines or the Strokes, says Specter Corp. Yeah, last time I was in here, I got some comparison to some musician as well. I don't know. Um, all I know is this is with the weather outside. This helps an awful lot, a hell of a lot. Are you a fan of the Libertines with the Strokes? Um, no, I'm the sort of person where I know songs. I'm good at no words. I don't know the name. I don't know who sings them most of the time. To be honest, uh, great to see Vernie on this morning. You get a lot, a lot of love here. It must be Christmas. <laughs> Uh, Eamon Fogarty says, real pay-per-view comes to the GEA. Going to be some fun next year when people realise that subscription has reached the championship. Where are the anti-Sky crowd now thinking of the poor Owlad? Um, I think uh, Larry McCarthy is making the point that people have accepted pay-per-view, that the world has moved on. Yeah, I think so. Um, and the point of this is as well with Sky, that's something that, you know, that's a monthly thing. This is, you know, it's 59 quid or whatever. As I said before Christmas, 79 thereafter. That is the kind of way of the world at the moment. I think it's reasonable enough. Now, the only thing I would say is, like, there's no Joe McDonough Cup games as part of this, you know, which I think is really disappointing because it's the second tier of Ireland. Um, it's already over there not really been seen and if they stuck it on here it would be like oh ideally yeah. yeah like Diego would have had 
McDonough Cup games before. Like, it's disappointing from an awfully point of view and from other counties it's that are trying it, to grow. Very interesting point you made about them. Um, it just has to wash its face. Like uh, the GA finances are quite opaque, but the GA makes a load of money and doesn't have to pay the players. At the, most, the vast majority of the money comes from the big games in Croke Park. That's where the sponsorship deals from. That's where the TV rights come from. So they can actually afford to build this thing over the next 15, 20 years. And that, this is a long-term play for them where what will happen is they'll start doing all those extra games. Maybe not the first year, but in year two, make sure that you, know, you don't overextend yourself. But then all of a sudden it becomes this massive, uh, proper TV channel over yeah. the top. And... You know, your your fifty nine quid becomes ninety nine quid, but actually you get uh, the McCrory Cup and you get the Sigerson and you get the Fitzgibbon, and you're like, well, okay, well, now I'm interested. It's a GA network, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's the long term plan here. Yeah. Uh, and over, but time, they also have yeah. the finances to do it. They'll, they'll, you know, all the sports organisations, with the exception of the FAI, traditionally who were telling us that they had loads of money and they didn't. Uh, the RFU were always like, oh, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Like, hey, you're sitting on a massive land bank there. And they sold the land bank and they, they're back in surplus again. And the GA also just sold the land before COVID to build a hotel on um, Clonif. So they have loads of, they actually have loads of money and they're a really well-run organisation. And that's a positive thing. I'm not mm. criticising them. They can totally afford to invest in this over the next 15, 20 years and turn it into something that everybody goes, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, there's also talk of um, the GA basically starting to, you know, I was on, uh, was I actually on, I'm not sure it was, I remember around David Tuberty being the league's top scorer a couple yes, of years yeah, ago, yeah. Uh, but that was something that was handed to me by an old fella uh, who does stats, like, and I would, I kind of happened upon that, but by all accounts it looks like they're finally going to start putting a database of records together. So this, along with a potential GA network, um, listen, you're going to have to, yeah, in, it's the nature of the world, you're going to have to pay for it. Um, but I think it is a progressive move, I have to say. All right, up next, Alan Quinlan, ahead of the Heineken Champions Cup. But first, here is Ursula Jacobs from last night's show, where Nathan tried to convince her to keep playing for one more year with Outert. And if Sarsfields do win, that means if you look at the last decade, it'll be three for Sarsfields, three for Schlock Neil, three for Outert the Ballock. Bring you back, bring you back for another year, the motivation to go and win a fourth. Oh, God. Um, well, look, at you know, it, I have to say the standard in the last few years um, in Club Camogie has really been uh, phenomenal. You know, it's really gone to another level. And look, credit to the likes of Schlock Neil, who we played last year, Sarsfields, ourselves, you know, have been there or thereabouts, um, as you said, in the last decade. And it's it's hard to believe that, um, you know, how, how quickly time has passed by, but Look, it's it, it's it's a credit to those teams to consistently be coming back every year. And ourselves in Owlert, you know, probably a few people had written us off last year and, and we came back again. So, look, who knows? Who knows what 2023 will bring? But let's just hope for a, a really exciting, brilliant final on Saturday evening. Right. Uh, Alec Quinlan is with us. Um, we had Rod on earlier. Still doesn't know where the game is going to be played. Uh, quietly hoping for it to be in Dublin. Sounds like I'll oh, fly to Belfast and get the, the coach down. But... Not not ideal for Ulster to be facing La Rochelle all of a sudden in the RDS if that does happen. No, it wouldn't be, I think, uh, given what happened last week away in Sale. Um, they'd like to get home, get the crowd behind them, get a good start in the game because um, I think, uh, you know, I was listening to both of you this morning and, you know, Roger's always intriguing about the mental side of things and, you know, standards and stuff like that. And that's it doesn't surprise me at all that he's always thinking that way he was like that as a player so you know mentally getting the La Rochelle side after winning it last year it's always hard when you win a trophy to keep the standard or even prove it because you know every time team that play La Rochelle it, it's a big game it's yeah. a bigger game because you've won something so um, mentally um, it, it, it's a big test for them as well going away to Ulster and um, knowing there's going to be a reaction you know we spoke about on Monday about and it's uh, a lot of people have spoken about, you know, the surprise at Leinster the way, or at, at, at Ulster, the way they capitulated over in sale. I think there was a hangover from the Leinster game, the second half of the Leinster game in the RDS the week before. We've always questioned their mentality a little bit, um, respectfully. Because well, there was a flakiness there. Yeah, and, you know, Ulster are a side that can go to the two lose and win like they did last year yeah. produce a brilliant performance and then they lose the, the game back in, in Belfast so um, 
small margins when when at the top level and the mental side of it is 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 really important and i think um so it doesn't surprise me that he's continuously trying to push that because he was like that as a player but this is a big big pressure game for Ulster and Dan McFarland's side they will want it in Belfast going down to Dublin is not going to be ideal for them it makes it um takes away a little bit of that home advantage the obvious home advantage and the energy that they can create in the Kingspan Yeah I do wonder what the atmosphere will be like will there be a lot of um, La Rochelle fans all of a sudden um, coming up from Munster and Leinster like you know we I don't think so Sports sports fandom is weird we don't really want our neighbours to be doing well yeah, and uh, we're good at, as Irish people at uh, <laughs> clipping each other. Then when they come together for Ireland, we... That's we're, all we're fine. All one, yeah, all that's that. different. But um, I think there's a lot of people who would have a lot of respect for Ron, and, uh, particularly in the supporting plan for Ireland. So it wouldn't surprise me if there was Munster people and Leinster people hoping that La Rochelle could possibly beat Ulster. Um, on the flip side of it, there'd be other many people thinking it's an Irish side against the French side. We want the Irish side to do well. So you get a mixture of everything there, really, don't you? And yeah. we've had that debate for so long when Leinster are playing, do Munster fans want them to lose or win? Yes. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a minority on both sides. There and is. It works both ways. Yeah. When we were winning in 06 and 08, we're, you know, there was probably more of a Leinster... You were, you were likeable, though. Group, yeah. Possibly. It was okay the first time, Alan. I don't know, was I ever likeable, Gerald, the way I played? But um, there was probably more Leinster people saying, well, look, you know, but then when the rivalry and the bitterness and the lack of them not, Leinster not winning it, it's all relaxed now, you know, everyone is... Uh, it is relaxed, I, and but it shouldn't be, right? I That's even had a brother, my brother, during the week telling me, God, I like watching Leinster, like, they're great. And I was there, Jesus, you're gone soft. You know what I mean? So... Um, we want to smarten up a little bit down there. Exactly. Uh, speaking of that game on Sunday, right? Um, Northampton Munster, one o'clock live commentary on off the ball on News Talk. Um, what what do you expect in terms of a uh, response from Munster to last week? Because they've they've got a lot of credit for even uh, O'Gara today in the, in the paper saying you know real signs he enjoys watching them again. You can see what that the um, coaching ticket is trying to do and. Um, that's a dangerous place where you lose a game and you get it's, credit, you know? It's 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 down to expectation and reality, you know. Munster of and, and it's from even the last number of years I've always thought if Munster get in near the knockout stages and they get that home quarterfinal round sixteen, they'll be very hard to beat. They're possibly in a quarterfinal semi final and then it's kinda of roll of the dice, bit of luck, getting right, injuries. And maybe they could. We saw last year they maybe were they could. Yeah. Foolishly, you might be thinking maybe they could um, surprise. And, and if they get in near near that that end scenario, the history and the stuff might. So uh, there's a few times where I've thought that maybe they have a chance this year. We like with all due respect, and I think um, they know this themselves. They're not winning the European Cup this year because you have to have real depth in your squad. Um, I think if they get all their players available and if they had RG Snyman back and you know they've a dog bow missing Thomas Ahern at the moment Finney and Witcherly so there's a bit of, de- of a depth problem there in around the pack to, to tweak things as they go along um, Andrew Conway is still out Keith Earls is just back um, if they had everyone fit and available I think they'd be a handful for most teams on their day but so giving them the pass um, is is down to really and I spoke about this at the start of the season, is the expectation and the change of, of the way they're playing and dealing in reality. So what we're seeing now, and I've always said this about Munster, fan, Munster fans, and I feel it as a former player, if you go out and play with passion, fight, energy, and you're trying to play, the fans will accept that. Um, of course they'll give out when they lose and things should have been better and stuff like that. But... You know, it's not that the Munster mentality is now accepting of, of being second best or second rate or third rate or whatever the case may be. But I think there's a little bit of optimism there and it's kind of a bit of more of a glass half full. Um, people are trying to be optimistic there and say, look, they've seen changes and, and we've seen them. So most the, teams would struggle against that Toulouse side, home yeah. or away. The one thing is that there have been, 
in in the Van Grand era, and it's uh, it's hard to compare and contrast because it's so early in the new era, right? But in the Van Grand era, there will be these good one-off performances, yeah. and then immediately afterwards, it'll be a letdown. So they do. Ulster beat them in a the quarter final at home yeah. a couple of years back, and then last year the the Toulouse game great, but then immediately afterwards, URC out. Competition over, season yeah. over. But that's dead down to depth. It's down to mentality. It's down to coaching. A lot of teams, it's like the FA Cup, isn't it? Historically, in in England, or um, a club GA game where the favourites are coming to town or whatever, and you can rally the troops, you can create a buzz and energy, you can go out and rip into them. The old Irish mentality, bring passion, energy. You can't do that every week, Jerry. You can't get that energy and emotion at any sport. Where where you get a balance is it's built on sand. Get, yeah, and it's having That's what so you tweak yeah. it three or four changes. The guys that are coming in are hungry, but they're good, good players as well and well coached. They're pissed off that they're not selected the yeah. week before, so they have a point to prove. So you can actually, Cody has done it the best over the years, hasn't he? With Kilkenny, mm. you know, making those two or three changes, keeping that that the fires burning. Um, and creating a little bit of a bitterness and stuff. It's down to depth. So Munster don't have that depth across the board and they don't have that experience. But what we're seeing is some young players and some positive signs. So it's a big game. It's a massive game because this is one now that... Don't, don't, like, make sure the progress the, is, the, is the, real. The kind of free pass is, 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 is not there for this one. So if Munster go over to Northampton and have a really poor performance and are beaten, well then... It kind of sets them back a little bit. So it's a pressure game for them. If they win it, they have a real chance of being in the round 16 because you'd imagine then that Northampton are, are finished because they've lost their first two, that Munster would beat them in the back-to-back game. And then they're possibly on eight or nine, ten points, but they didn't get a bonus. But they got a losing bonus point last week. So if they were to get four or five over, you're on five or six, and then the Northampton game, you could be up you're, around you're 10 fine. or 11 points, possibly. Yeah. yeah. It, that's, you're in the qualifying zone there. And then you're heading to Toulouse with the pressure off, throw caution to the wind a little bit. Um, and and they're in the round 16. But look, losing Sunday, and it's, it's there's no round 16. No. But the, the reality is, they're going, again, they're playing a side that it just depends what. Chris Boyd and his uh, Phil Dawson who he played against many times if it was him standing in front of the players he's a real competitive guy I played against him many times he's their coach um, I think that they're going to meet a Northampton side I think that will, won't will make it easy for him and will really want to win this game so it's it's a pretty um, it's a tough place to go in Northampton but it's a real test for Munster and I, there's no gimme here this there's a, I don't like the fact that there's a bit of a Munster will go to Northampton and win on Sunday. They're not saying it themselves. This is going to be a real kind of tough, tough game for them. But there's an opportunity there because it's not a Toulouse, it's not a La Rochelle, it's not a Leinster, it's not a, you know, a big, big, big squad of players. Just as a brief aside, Alan, and something you mentioned earlier, um, you had an edge to your play. There was a bitterness towards, we'd say, the, the Leinster players. How did you find going into the Ireland camp then? Were you able to camp that? Uh, you know, when you're seeing a lad and you're, not, you know, you're you know, very physical with him, all that kind of crack, were you able to part that when you went sure. into Ireland? And is that completely different now? The edge, not to say that the edge is gone, but they're with each other so much more now at international level. It's taken away a bit of that edge. It as has, well. and it's down to it. We spoke about these rivalries many times. Yeah, it's it's Team Ireland now, and that's maybe it's for the best. Um, it takes a little bit away. It doesn't mean that uh, Leinster or Munster don't want to beat each other, and Leinster have shown that. Uh, they've been pretty ruthless in in their in their performances against Munster. They'll they'll always want to beat each other, and the same with the other provinces. Connacht, Munster has become a real kind of spark to that mm-hmm. that derby match over the years. Was I able to park very easily? And you might think I'd be the one that wouldn't because for, for the way I played a little bit, but very easily because I always thought that um, um, you know being being selected in an Irish squad was a real privilege, and you've got to buy into it. So I never had an issue with it. And I don't think anyone ever had. I think what would have happened is players would have been... And this happened in 09 after the Grand Slam when that famous Rob Carney statement when he said the Munster players play with more passion and they're more with Munster than Ireland. So um, 
that kind of brought it out in the open and, and made it uh, made players more conscious of it and I think it had an, a, a different a difference because naturally everyone would mix around together in the hotels and stuff like that but they wouldn't be heading out you know we went on a trip to Lanzarote one time at pre-season training camp in December I think it was 2006 five or six and uh, I think we, we we got the pass for a few points one night and there was seven Munster players or eight Munster players down reception one Leinster player that was Mallow Kelly and it wasn't that the Leinster fellas didn't want to go but they were naturally doing stuff with them th- themselves you they were know. cliques though that's that's the definition of cliques yeah yeah but when that was brought out in the about open it. Same, yeah. yeah we hadn't really thought about it so it was just naturally well you, you're you at dinner and you kind of go to a couple of your closer mates and friends and we, we go for a pint or we're going down to the shop or we're going out for a bite to eat that stuff happened but um, it didn't always happen and it didn't happen because of people consciously made decisions to go well, don't ask him, don't ask him, and you know, keep it quiet. It just was like we're going for a few pints, and this stuff happened a bit, but um, it didn't always happen. You know, I remember uh, we were in Bilbao for 2003 World Cup for a training camp, and we went out, and it was everybody, know, everybody kind of in. Um, so that didn't always happen. So, but I think it around that time, it was really. Um, Declan Kidney was the one who kind of had that meeting and stuff and it was well documented that here's a young Leinster player challenging a kind of a group who who maybe well who had won two European Cups not consciously decided that you know we just kind of moved around in the groups together and um, but it's different now they're all mates they're pals they do lots of stuff together they meet outside of rugby and stuff so it's it's just different times uh, let's talk about the the Leinster Gloucester game um Gloucester make 13 changes from their win over Bordeaux last week. I checked the spread, there's 35. Leinster are 35 point favourites for the game tonight. Not great for the Heineken Cup. No, it's not. And it's uh, it's very it's very disappointing in a sense that you're you're in round two and you have this many changes in a, in um, a Gloucester side coming to Dublin. Do I do I blame Gloucester? Well, no. so just explain, they're they're gonna be grand. Well, they, they so they won last week against Bordeaux. Uh, bonus point win at home, five points on the board. Um, they've three games left in in this th- these rounds. There's four rounds, um, so they've three games left. They have big Premiership games coming up in the next few weeks and through the festive period. Uh, do they send their full strength side to Dublin and still realistically get beaten, get bruised and battered, or do they rest them this week? concede the match practically and and uh, keep them all ready for their for their league game next week and their run of matches that they've coming up um, so I don't blame Gloucester I, I think the tournament format there's a problem with it I'm kind of sitting on the fence here because I find it hard I think the format changed the, the problem here player welfare and all that stuff has come to the to the fore in the last number of years for rugby finding more weekends for these and and like that emotional thing that I was saying to you Michael getting kind of up every week and expecting teams to be up and all big games is hard and it kind of wears out clubs and players but something has gone wrong the two pools of 12 makes it very confusing to know who's playing who or what what relevance the table yeah, has like yeah you can go into your your computer or your phone and see the fixtures and find them but just having people talking about them yeah. having an interest in them well the pool draw was great because you used to be able to go oh the back to back would be around now there'd already be a couple of games gone I, I just love that as a player yeah. you, you're going over uh, start of December and you're th- these two weekends in December uh, last week and this weekend back to back I'll never forget playing Papillon in one of, I think it was 2002 or 2003 we beat them well in Thomond Park and thought you know we're, we're in a good position. We went over there the week after and got absolutely, not not scoreline, but just we we, cre- we we encountered a different beast. They were angry, they were aggressive, they were dirty, they were, the crowd were on top of us. Um, I loved that and, and over the years it was brilliant. I'm not saying that it has to go back, but there's something wrong now that you're in round two and you have teams and they won't be the only team that'll be picking weekend teams this weekend. Um, Gloucester, but it's disappointing because. But Gloucester can pick a weekend team, get hammered by sixty points, and still qualify for the last sixteen. So they can go then and play uh, Bordeaux away in the next game, and by which stage Bordeaux? No, Leinster away in the next game. Um, 
still having Leinster at home is going to be very difficult for them in the King's home but their priority is the Premiership and yeah. and you know if you ask them if you ask them what, what their goal is this season is it to win a European Cup I don't know but it's it's a shame it's a pity because the old format a lot of people mention the old format but going back to what I was saying we, we have a less weekend this year in the, in the Champions Cup Heineken Champions Cup because um you know, we normally would have had nine rounds. We've eight rounds this year. We had nine last year, even in the old format. Yeah. But going right back to the old format of the, the pools of four, um, coming out of work. that, yeah. top two maybe get out. Can I move on? Because I'm nearly out of time. But um, during the week, I was like, well, Warren Gatlin, he's just back. What's what's the first grenade he's going to lob? It's like, oh, uh, Andy Farrell's the only man for the Lions job. I was like, that's interesting, Warren. I wonder, wonder what his experience was coming back from the Lions every time and how easy it was to just drop the players you know not bring them on the Lions tour and then go back into the squad and go no I still love you you're still really good you're just not as good as him but I'm going to ask you to go and beat them now next week it's not I, I often wonder if actually no current international head coach should be the Lions manager that actually you need to be outside of the yeah, four there's, there's, countries yeah but he's had great success to be fair um the biggest disappointment was the, side, the, the last tour, I think. Yeah, it was and terrible, it kind but of, coming back was always difficult for him. Yeah, very difficult because you had an interim coach stepping in for Wales. He would have been out of the job for a year. Um, but it worked. It seemed to work. Would it work again? So if Andy Farrell was to step out for a year, maybe that's what happened with the Emerging Ireland Tour to, to, to let these player, the, co- the other coaches off and see if they can do the job. Who knows? But he is the obvious candidate. And I think... Um, so who's the, who's the interim head coach? Who's the interim head coach? Well, it's either Simon Eastery, Paul O'Connell. Well, do they do they oil up and wrestle for the job, or is it like no, you take it? It might you be a, jo- it? a joint role. Um, neither might want it, um, but I don't know. He's um, if to you know for the next Lions tour. But so, listen, all can change in two thousand and twenty-three. It look, did happen in nineteen. So yeah. Andy Farrell might be under pressure this time next year, World Cup, all that kind of stuff. So who knows? And he knows that. But I think at the moment... There's two ways of looking at it. Glass half full is... Uh, well, the glass half full is, is is there's a lot of Irish players in the Lions tour if it's next week. And also then... That can change very, very quickly. Sure, but it, to finish that, like if, if he goes and does the job, right, and O'Connell steps up and is the interim head coach, then the succession plan is immediately there for after the next World Cup. Say, say it all goes well, right? For whatever yeah. whatever that definition is. Then O'Connell gets like a full year of being the head coach with no massive pressure because he knows that Farrell's coming back after the Lions and he's got that experience and then the, the IRFU are in a happy place where it's like, well, we, we know we have an international quality head coach who, who's cut his teeth, has had the experience, is part of the system and is, you know, so I can see how that would work. Yeah, but that's if the results are good, yeah, if yeah. it happens, you yeah. know what I mean? So it's a results-driven business. Last half empty, it all goes to shit. <laughs> yeah, of course, but at the moment you would think he's the obvious candidate and um, I think this time with Gatti, I think... Um, He's just telling the truth. It's not a grenade. Yeah, it's not a grenade, and I'm I think always, he's uh, maybe he. He's always they have a very good relationship as well, Andy sure Farrell, and, sure and so yeah, he yeah. could be an assistant coach. I'm just cynical, you know. Oh, maybe, yeah. He could he be could going with Andy yeah. Farrell. Rolls reverse this time. Having but, the crack. Um, yeah, for sure. As a uh, as on provocateur. Well, that would be interesting. So long as uh, Andy Farrell gets to decide what rugby the Lions plays as opposed to Gatlin, because it was terrible the last time. It so. wasn't good the last time, and uh, but that wasn't down to Warren Gatlin totally. No, I think it was these assistant coaches and stuff and came out about that as well. The way they played, they tried to muscle up against South Africa, didn't they, and not play rugby and hope it got them one result, but lost yeah. them the other two tests. All right, Alan, good stuff. Thanks, Cheers. thanks, lads. It's uh, eight minutes past nine. OTBAM is brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Make sure you tune into the lunchtime wrap today. It brings you all the latest sports news. It's with thanks to Deliveroo. Check out the app for some great match day meal deals across the World Cup. Deliveroo, food, we get it. Here's what's on the OTB Sports Radio uh, for you today. Joe meets Ruby Walsh at 1 o'clock is OTB Gold. Matt Rushmore is Dublin at 3 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, it's uh, Team 33 LOI legend Liam Coyle. OTB Gold is James McLean at 6. And then Johnny Ward is hosting you tonight to take you through the evening. And as things stand, we do expect that Vera Powell is coming in studio today for an interview with Nathan so we'll air that this evening for you uh, you can follow OTV across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTV Podcast Network for all the best in latest sports content after the break we're joined by a pair of actors behind two iconic Irish TV series Simon Delaney from Bachelors Walk and Owen Colgan from Hardy Books to chat ahead of the World Cup final OTB AM best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all the hear. <laughs> 
Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? I was at the game in Lasail last night. The biggest cheer of the night was when Ronaldo warmed up during the second half. Sorry, the second biggest cheer was when Ronaldo warmed up. The biggest cheer was when Ronaldo came on the pitch. There is still this fixation of Ronaldo is coming onto the pitch and he buys into that. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. Are you a sports fanatic who loves to travel? Then sportspass.ie is for you. Log on for the chance to win the trip of a lifetime in 2023 to a top global sporting event. Eight winners get to choose from 12 incredible prizes, including trips to the Women's World Cup in Australia, the Super Bowl, the Masters and WrestleMania. All prizes include return flights, accommodation and tickets for two people from anywhere in the world. That's sportspass.ie. You win, you choose. OTB AM With Gillette Get into your flow With the new Gillette Labs Razor With exfoliating bar 10 minutes past 9 this Friday morning It's the Friday morning of the World Cup final On Sunday afternoon And I'm delighted to welcome Simon Delaney and Owen Colgan to the show Gentlemen, you're both very welcome Um, Owen, it looks like you're uh, cheering for Argentina I'm a, a master of deduction here Hello guys, how are you getting on? How's it going? Can you hear me? We can, yeah How are you? I'm kind of losing you there, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely cheering on Argentina. I'm actually in Buenos Aires as we speak. Uh, Buenos Aires in Mayo or in uh, actual Buenos Aires? Buenos Aires is uh, Buenos Aires in Donegal, which is like a spin-off town. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm actually I'm actually in Buenos Aires in Argentina. Are you really? Wow. When did you decide yeah. to go? What's that? When did you decide to go to Argentina? What did I sell? A couple of couple of kidneys, but uh, it was definitely worth it. It's a great atmosphere here. Vamos Argentina. Wow, unbelievable. They give me the matte as well, so. Does it work? It's lovely stuff, yeah. This really gets you into the mood. This is just <laughs> regular matte, but this is what everyone's drinking on the streets. Uh, very good. Um, Simon Delaney, who are you up for? Uh, well, I got France in the draw and work, so I'll be gone for France. That was enough to keep you keep you on board? You weren't like, <laughs> yeah, n- yeah, not yeah. for you, the romance of Leo Messi finally crowning his career? Screw that. Well, you know, what? we were watching the first game on set while we were filming, which, of course, we shouldn't have been doing um, when Argentina got beaten. And I, I turned to someone and I said, after the game, I said, now's the time to back them because obviously their price will get better and uh, they'll, I think they'll go all the way. So I think it's the point that everybody everybody wanted, but I just think France are going to be too strong on Sunday. I kind of have that feeling as well that actually, I, I hope I'm wrong. And everybody keeps telling me, oh, Argentina are getting better as the tournament goes on. Yeah. But I just have this little bit of concern that better defence, better midfield, better attackers. And uh, I, d- I do think, um, completely biased as an Aston Villa fan, that uh, our goalkeeper is way better than their goalkeeper. <laughs> yeah, there is that. He's And he's a bit of a character, isn't he? Um, he's certainly a man for riding the crowd up. Um, yeah, I just think man for man, France are a better team, but the romantics amongst us, you know, still want Messi to do it on Sunday, but I think it'll be France. Um, we're just going to try and fix the line to Owen there, so Sam, I might stick with you for a moment. <clears throat> uh, yeah. the, the World Cup, obviously, born of controversy, right? Um, and uh, massive amounts of corruption led to the World Cup being here, and horrific uh, at the start of, um, over the last number of years, the amounts of deaths that have been uh catalogues and and yet mm. the whole sports washing thing has, has worked to the point where everybody's saying this is one of the greatest world cups of all time that's just how um that's just how life works yeah it's it was a strange one coming into it because we're all so used to watching and loving the world cup and the whole thing about a being in qatar then the time of year and the idea of watching the world cup the week before christmas day it all just felt so so wrong for so many different reasons but it has been a great tournament. Um, I, I, I was a bit disappointed in terms of, you know, not disappointed in terms of the, the levels of protest, but, you know, there was so much uh, talk before the tournament about, you know, it shouldn't be here. People are going to try and make a point while they're out there. The whole controversy with the armbands then before the first game, I thought that would have rolled on a bit further through the tournament, uh, but it seemed to sort of die away. Yeah, it definitely did. No, no individual player has actually taken no. a, a significant stand who you hoped would take a significant stand. Um, once the football started, they decided that they they were all about their business. Uh, yeah. One one last point on this before we go on. Um, I have to say I'm loving the Christmas World Cup. I think it's great. 
I would be yeah. all up for this again if that was to happen in future. Yeah, it's it, there's there's something about it. This is we all kind of forgot about, you know, the controversies and all that when we were being served up three and four different four matches a day. There's just something about it. I mean, I I've been watching it with uh, <coughs> my sons. You know, the eldest is 16, then a 14-year-old, 10-year-old, and 6-year-old, and they've, they've really been into it. Um, and I, I, I've often made the comment, and I've made this through previous World Cups as well, when you have the likes of, you know, Tunisia playing, they're, they are games that you would never seek out and watch at any other time of the year in any other competition. But when you're getting served up these games one after the other, it's just... <laughs> I mean, it is a festival of football, and we can't get away from it. And it, it, those some of the games have been. I mean, I what the first three games I watched were nil nil draws. So I thought it was a bit of an Uncle Albert. I said I'm not going to watch anymore. But I think as the tournament went on, we got some great shocks, some great surprises. There's been some cracking games, um, and I was listening to Kevin Kilban earlier on talking about the the refereeing. I mean, yeah, it, it was okay up to the quarterfinal stage, but my God, the wheels came off then in terms of refereeing. Some of it's been absolutely atrocious. It is mad that they invented VAR and uh, it has managed to yeah. screw things up. Are you a fan of the summer or winter? What's your take? Uh, I'm not a big soccer fan in general. I've on, I only started tuning in was that last Friday night in the middle of uh, Holland and Argentina? Good time but to start. By God, I turned it on yeah. at the right time. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I just thought the the cojones for that for that last free kick to not take the shot and try and work it. And even with the the fella lying down behind the wall, it was just fascinating. And then obviously watching England as well is just a fascination. Irish people have a fascination with with English football, and it's probably throw it to the two boys as well, and maybe just to, to own first like. What was the reaction to to Harry Kane's penalty penalty miss? Can you hear us, Owen? Yes, I was in there. Question was: What was your reaction when Harry Kane missed the penalty? He put it into another you know planet. What? I'll tell you. I'll tell you the truth. I have a brother that's living in London, so I was actually in London for that game, and I was in a pub. And when Harry Kane missed the penalty, I had to pretend that I was upset by it, but. <laughs> there was a big reaction in the pub. People were upset. And I do know that Harry Kane, I have seen him holding a Mayo jersey. So half of me <clears> kind of wanted him to score. But at the same time, I don't think I would have liked to see them in the final because uh, they're a good team. But uh, if they won it, you'd never hear the end, the end of it. So, you know, I was kind of bittersweet to see him missing. But I'm happy that France are in the final against Argentina. But uh, I would be sick now if France win it again. Because, some, uh, yeah. some people reckon his curse started the minute he put his hands in that Mayo jersey. Pardon? Some people reckon that uh, Harry Kane's curse started the minute he put his hands in the Mayo jersey. Well, that curse is finished now because your man, unfortunately, the last fellow for the curse has passed away. So that curse is done and dusted. So England are going to need to have another excuse no more than Mayo next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's funny, bittersweet. So uh, was there, um, what was the pub like in the aftermath of the game? Who were they blaming? Pardon? Who were they blaming in the pub in England when after the match? Like, whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Sorry. <laughs> I was wondering who the England football fans that you were watching the game with, who did they blame when they went out? I was there, I was there with my brother and my father, actually, because uh, my, my brother had a child recently. So we were just the three of us in a pub in a corner. But most people were shouting for England. There was a few... A few uh, hidden French fans in there as well, so we kind of flocked towards them at the end of the game. But um, no, it was a great game, and England did well, you know. But it's again just to reiterate, it's nice to not see them in the final. Yeah, I don't know if um, I, 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 when he missed, I just couldn't believe it. Like I just couldn't, couldn't believe it. There was this, uh, there's obviously like a, a yelp, but I kind of wanted to see extra time. And I, I, I kind of wanted to see England. I know, it, it would have been nice. It would have been nice to see a bit extra time, yeah. And I think England, they almost deserved a bit of extra time. But um, again, you can't go against the French, you know. But I do think I do think that Argentina have it. From talking to people on the streets here now, there's a great atmosphere. And uh, I think that the Argentinians, now it's time for them to pick up that cup again. Was it always your plan to go to Argentina if they got this far? Or is this a coincidence? Yeah. No, no, it was, it was, because I'm, I'm actually, uh, I'm married to an Argentinian woman, so uh, she wanted, to, she said to me, if we get to the final, we have to go. So I found cheap flights out from Knock, um, although I had to go via Frankfurt. But uh, yeah, definitely it was the plan at the beginning of the World Cup. If they got to the final, we would be there in the heart of football, Buenos Aires. Where will you watch it? 
I'm going to watch it in a in a pub down the town. It's called a James Joyce pub, actually. So I'm going to go in there for a, a few quiet pints. But apparently, if I wear this jersey in there and let them know that I'm Irish with all the Adver Brown stuff, I won't have to put my hand in my pocket. <laughs> uh, free pints. Have so you've obviously been to Buenos Aires before? Pardon? <clears throat> you've obviously been to Buenos Aires before? No, no, no. First time here. First oh, time right. here. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm new to the scene, but uh, I'm really loving it. People are very friendly and uh, lots of handshakes going around. The thing that immediately struck me was, it was like, knocker doing direct flights to Buenos Aires? <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> no, they, I, had to go, I had to go back the way towards Frankfurt. It's almost like he was in London, he was following England, he's moved to Argentina now. I couldn't think of a better place to be, to be for the World I'm Cup final. The world. I'm, I've changed my license since lockdown. I wanted to just get out there, you know. Uh, Buenos Aires is, is wild when like I was there for St. Patrick's Day one year and the whole city not the whole city but a large portion of the city closed down and everybody was out in the streets so I can only imagine what it's going to be like if they actually win this thing you know there's a massive pressure on the team to deliver although the pressure seems less so uh, obviously with your uh, half Argentine life now what do you think the pressure is on Messi at this stage? I, I lash it there towards the end. What's the pressure like on Messi? Is there no pressure? Is he free? Or do you feel like he has to deliver this for the country? Do I feel like the whole country's behind Messi? Yeah, that'll do. Sorry there, I, I, I can't... Don't, can't don't worry about it, don't worry about now. it. I might put that one to you, Simon. Like, Messi looked troubled in, in previous World Cups, burdened down yeah. by the fact of, <clears throat> like, oh, you have to win the World Cup to reach Maradona status. This one, he doesn't seem to be playing with the same level of, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all, like, complete projection on my part, but it just feels like he, he seems a bit freer. Yeah, I mean, we can't even begin to imagine the amount of pressure that's on him because, you know, people have even stopped talking about it being France against Argentina. It's it's Messi against France, you know, the, the pressure that he must be under. Can you imagine if it goes, you know, the, the full the full length on Sunday and it goes to penalty kicks, you know, and he will, as he does, he'd probably step up first, unlike Neymar, but... Um, the pressure that he's under to deliver this and, and you know he's delivering it for for a country you know i i i think it's it's incredible it's all more it's all the more remarkable then that he's delivering those performances while under that pressure um because this probably will be when he's 35 his last world cup you know never say never he could come back uh, in four years time but i just don't know if that team i mean i've been really impressed with DePaul and you know, I think Martinez has been superb when he's played. They are a very, very good team, but I just think if you break it down and look at position for position, I just think for me, one of the players of the tournament has been Griezmann. Uh, you know, again, listen to Kevin earlier on talking about Deschamps' management in replacing Pogba. Uh, you know, with Griezmann, <clears throat> who would have thought of doing that? And it's worked beautifully. <clears throat> I just think France will edge it, but the pressure that Messi must be under. I mean, does the man not suffer with nerves? <clears throat> My God almighty, stand on that tunnel on Sunday. And it will be effectively a home game. The, the Argentinian fans have been unbelievable right through the tournament. How so many of them are getting out there is beyond me because it ain't a cheap place to go or get to. Um, so the atmosphere will certainly be, it'll be like a home game. And the pressure on that man's shoulders, it's just staggering. Just speaking of pressure on Messi, I don't know if you saw that. Uh, it wasn't an interview necessarily, but it was a an Argentinian journalist, female journalist, basically having a word with Messi at the end of the interview, saying like, "Win, lose, or draw, this World Cup final, like you're still a legend to all of us." I was really getting emotional looking at it, and you're just kind of thinking. I think she was trying to not put pressure on him, but it, to me, it nearly put more pressure on him because she was downplaying it, and it just. But uh, I can't imagine. But he's he's dealt with it. Like he's dealt with it better this year than any other year. Would it be fair to say the pressure that's been on him? That's, I also think that's an interesting point in terms of that if we, if they don't win it, I think you know, unlike say you know maybe an English player who could miss a penalty, I don't think Messi will get slated the way say an English player might get slated for losing them the Euros or losing them the World Cup. I mean, there's almost that thing of it'll make him even more of a hero because he's done so much in this World Cup to get them to the final that if, you know, 
it's not it's never going to be his fault if they lose it they will be beaten if they're beaten they will be beaten by a better team on Sunday so I don't think it'll affect and I think you're dead right that reporter Ted Wright is not going to affect his his status as a, as an iconic figure in that country if they do lose it if he wins it I mean they'll basically just dip him in bronze and stick a statue of him in one of the main squares of Buenos Aires but I don't think he would get slated I think the, I think they'll feel sorry for him they'll get behind him even more I mean look at Look at the way they talk about Maradona. Yes, he delivered a World Cup in '86 and that, but you know, look at look at what happened to Maradona in his personal life and his career over the years. And the Argentinian people, there's almost a martyrdom to him, you know. And I think that if if Argentina lose on Sunday, it, it won't take away from Messi's achievements. You know, he's delivered a Copa America. He's already done that. He's taken that. You know, noose from his neck. That that's gone. He's won a tournament with the with the national team. Yes, the Holy Grail is the World Cup. And again, going back to the, like, he will be under huge pressure, as will the rest of the team. And I think what's been really interesting watching right through the tournament as well is listening to all of the other Argentinian players and their manager. Is that they're all basically saying we're doing it for him. They're not there to win the World Cup for themselves, even. You know, I mean, what an achievement for any player to be part of a squad that wins a World Cup. But they're all doing it because of him so when you have that mentality you know these lads are going to run through brick walls from and it could be a very interesting game on sunday in terms of how they decide to set up argentina you know will they will they try and beat france will they man mark them will they kick lumps out of them or will they just try and get the ball to messi and see what happens you know, it's going to be fascinating to watch it is it is and i do wonder right that's obviously a great psychological trick to, re to release the pressure on the rest of the team it's their cause mm. and everybody rallies behind it puts a little bit of extra pressure on him and if it works it's genius I and mean, if it fails at the end it's like you know I don't know I think you're right though that um, because the rest of the supporting cast isn't at the same level as France's if he manages to pull it off it's an even greater achievement than the great achievement of getting the team to a World Cup final again like he, he dragged the team to a World Cup final previously he's done it again They're, you know I'm not writing off the rest of the team because uh, obviously, there's some really, really, really good footballers in it. But on the other side of this, right, France also looking for a little bit of history. The second mm -hmm. manager in history to retain it. The last one was in the 30s. Like, you know, mm -hmm. literally a completely... Those World Cups, by all accounts, were chaos and um, interesting. Uh, and there must be extra pressure on them a little bit that they're trying to be as great as the Brazil team of Pelé. And Mbappe is stepping into the natural successor to Pele as somebody who goes and wins three World Cups in his lifetime. Like, it's it's a level of... Um, like, what's riding on this is is all-time <clears throat> greatness. That's the, the size of the game on Sunday. Yeah, that's very true, and that lies on both sides. I mean, as you say, France get the chance to do something that is truly historic on Sunday. Deschamps as well, what an achievement it will be for him. Um, the Mbappe thing, I mean... I don't know whether I speak for the majority of the football community, but I mean, I wouldn't be the biggest Mbappe fan. I think it's, he is, you know, look at look at the current deal, the, or the most recent deal he signed at PSG. I mean, some people would say that he's he's everything that's wrong with the current game, you know, in terms of the modern player, player power. You know, how, how in the name of God does a player have written into his contract that he has decisions on who the manager is, on who transfers in and transfers out. But that's that's a whole different debate, which you've had before. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't feel <clears throat> outside of France there's a general love for wanting Mbappe to do it. I mean, again, you're right, Jerry. Step back and look at what's what's on on the line on Sunday. I mean, Mbappe has the chance to win two World Cups. He's what? What is he? Twenty three? Yeah. Is he even twenty three? I mean, that's staggering. Deschamps, first manager to win it twice. You know, the country themselves, first ones to win it back to back since sixty. I mean, there's so much on riding on the game from for for, for both countries. I think neutrals, um, and again, the romantics amongst us will be screaming for Messi. They want Messi to do it. Um, but, uh, and you know, going back to even the last World Cup, you know, watching Pogba and as a United fan, watching those videos ad nauseum of Pogba's speeches in the dressing room after, and thinking, well, where does that does that disappear when he comes to Old Trafford? You know, wh where is that player? Um, is there a lot of love generally for for the French team? I mean, they've had they've had a decent tournament. Griezmann's had a brilliant tournament. Um, you know, they've had some 
They've, like not that they've had an easier path, but I think is is there general love for the French team? I don't know. The finals. You, you bring up an interesting point about Mbappe, right? And but I don't know if everybody remembers Antoine Griezmann had like a a TV live decision about where he was going to go <laughs> in the style of a LeBron James, like, and it was this massive thing on the internet for twenty four hours. Where and then he announced he was just signing a new contract with Atletico Madrid. Like he yeah. didn't have a big reveal. At least when LeBron made the decision, it was like, oh, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. It was like, oh, he's gone to Miami. That's going to be interesting. He was like, I've signed a new deal with my current employers. And the whole world had to stop and watch this. Like the, so there's definitely a strain of ego. Now, Griezmann's obviously backing it up at the moment with his performances. So, uh, no, definitely. There is, but there's also that thing, Jer, of, you know, of you talk about ego and all that. You know, I work in a business uh, where, where ego is... <laughs> It's it's alive and well, but but in my business, <clears throat> in terms of actors and that, you know, I've seen it, it, it. It's it's not the person. It's it's the it's the cohort. It's the entourage around them. Like you, you know, did Griezmann sign up for that thing when someone said to him, "Do you know what we'll do? We'll do this thing where we do a big reveal." Like, how much is a player involved in decisions like that? The Alexis Sanchez re- reveal video for United, the piano thing. <laughs> How much is the player involved in that? Like, does he go to his market? People said, lads, I have a great idea now for when I sign. I'm going to play a piano. Yeah. I mean, because I see it in terms of on set and, and groups around people and, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> it just entourages. I mean, I wonder how much do, you know, how, how much are the players responsible for things like that? And going back to Mbappe, that whole you know, his contract, he didn't negotiate that contract. So I'm not slating him for saying, Jesus, he demanded he shout and who's the manager and who's in and who's out. His, his team, you know, negotiated that contract. His team, you know, would have suggested, this is what we're going to ask for. These are the clauses we're going to look for. Now, look, at the end of the day, Mbappe has to go, yeah, great idea, let's do that. Or no, I'm yeah. taking a stand. But I'm just wondering how much is the individual, like when we point all this, not hatred, but this talk about, you know, Mbappe being everything's wrong with the modern game, he's the Instagram footballer, it's all that bullshit of, you know, stuff you see on the training ground, but that that's a marketing team around him, like he doesn't wake up in the morning and go, lads, can we post a video of me of Nutmeg and Varane and, you know, it's... Yeah, but he, uh, he backs it up with performances is the other thing, you can, you well, can get away true. with it, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And we, we tolerate it because the performances are yeah. at such a high level, so... Uh, it's well set up. Oh, it is well set up. Just when you're talking about unveilings, the Santi Cazorla unveiling is the best one ever. I don't remember that one. You know, where he's like, uh, it's almost like a tube in the middle of the pitch. He signs with some European club and uh, there's all smoke in it and all of a sudden he's just standing there like that with his arms <laughs> folded and there's a lad doing all like what looks like magic in front Villa of him. Villarreal, I'm reliably Villarreal, yeah. It was yeah. madness. Look it up. It's hilarious. Yeah. I did like Santi Cazorla. I thought he was a great player. He was. N- n- beautiful little left foot on him. Uh, right, Simon, you've been very good with your time. I understand you have COVID as well, so uh, you've been a trooper for us yes. this morning. What are you working on at the moment? Are you allowed to tell us, or is that all top secret? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I've been filming a thing up in Belfast since October, Ger. Um It's a new six-part drama series for the BBC and uh, Showtime. Um, and we're, we're on our Christmas hiatus now, as the Americans call us. We're back on sale on the 3rd of January, and we film right through to the end of February, so... That's going to hit the screens probably uh, October next year. So, yeah, that's pretty much been been. And I'm lucky enough to get COVID the week I finish for Christmas. So uh, I'm in currently in isolation ward two in Delaney Towers here. Swings and roundabouts a little bit. Uh, at least the, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, the telly is decent uh, at this time of year. Correct. And and uh, and like, what's the name of the project? Are you? Is that? Yeah, no, it's 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 called The Woman in the Wall, and it uh, stars Ruth Wilson, who you'd know from Luther. Mrs. Wilson's War and uh, the brilliant Daryl McCormick from Peaky Blinders, and then there's a great cast uh, cast of Irish actors that are making making up the ensemble. It's 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 a drama set in the west of Ireland in a fictional village in the west of Ireland, and it revolves around two murders: a murder down in that village and a murder in Dublin, and the two murders are uh, are connected. So, brilliantly written, <coughs> excuse me, by Joe Murta, um, <coughs> whose parents were from the west of Ireland, and. Uh, yeah, we're we're sort of halfway through that now, so we'll see the uh, results of that near the end of next year. 
uh, fictional villages in the west of Ireland are so hot right now. That's your, your Derek <laughs> Zoolander moment. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, yeah, that's it, yeah. So I'm trying my best West of Ireland accent now to be from County Mayo over that side, you know. There you go. The curse is <laughs> over. We were reliably informed this morning. That was news to me. <laughs> Simon, great to have you with us. Thanks a million. Best of luck. Cheers. My pleasure. Take care. Enjoy the final on Sunday, lads. You too. Thanks, Thanks a million. Uh, our thanks to Simon Delaney and Owen Colgan. Unfortunately, the line to Buenos Aires didn't um, re-establish itself uh, in good enough quality because he was guessing my questions and um, sometimes they were better than the original ones. So. I kind of thought at one stage that he was actually just trying to take the piss out of you. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still not sure that wasn't the case. I, you know, is he actually a knock? You just know, you just never know. No, you just you never, never know. You never do. Uh, right, so Bally Gunner going to win? Oh, just about. Just about. So Bally Gunner sent... Thomas's final? Bally Gunner Thomas's, yeah. But I have this in you know then you get like a gut instinct that Bally Hale are gonna play even above themselves on I Sunday. Oh I know. I but, uh, just, we're, I'm just probably just gonna go on form, I'd say. Two screens, you're gonna need two screens. And the Camogie final? Uh Sarsfields against Lockheed just about Sarsfields I'd say to do the back to back just the interesting one in Sarsfields as well there's five McGrath sisters involved their father is a manager their mother played hockey for Ireland as well good genes yeah good genes and next year the youngest sister Leisha who's 15 now will, will be eligible to play so there's potential for six of them to play wow. together that's Hopper McGrath of course of the legendary Galway team as well so yeah. right OTB AM live each morning with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day we've gone a, a bit later than usual but it's 9.35 back on Monday with our performance rankings Alan Quinn will be in to assess, assess the weekend's rugby which hopefully all of it gets uh, gets away plenty of World Cup reaction with Kevin Cabal on the line and more as well don't forget to tune in over the weekend live commentary from the Munster game Ashley's going to be at the Hurling and Camogie Club finals as well but right now we leave you with a chat from last night's show with Meg Linehan from The Athletic she broke the original story about allegations of misconduct in the AWSL and joined Nathan to talk to the latest report which obviously featured Ireland coach Vera Pau Cheers. The investigation, it all stems from an article in The Athletic last year when accusations of sexual coercion were made against the then North Carolina Courage coach Paul Riley. That story was broke by Meg Linehan, who's senior writer with The Athletic. And Meg is with us now. Good evening, Meg. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, this is an incredibly extensive report. The investigators reached out to almost 800 current and former players. Over 100 people were interviewed. Final report extends to 125 pages. And within that, some frankly shocking, horrific revelations of sexual misconduct among several male coaches in the league. I do want to talk about that, but obviously starting from an Irish point of view, uh, Vera Powell's inclusion as one of the nine coaches named in the report has raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, we should point out that what Vera Powell is accused of is obviously of a much lesser scale than several of the other coaches. It all relates to her time as head coach of Houston Dash back in 2018 and primarily relates to comments about players' weight and the control that she had over players' lives. Right. And, and that really, you know, just to kind of set the stage, obviously, there are a lot of layers to what we're talking about here. There are people like Paul Riley who are kind of at one end of the spectrum. And then from there, you, you do kind of honestly dial it back. But one of the things that I think is important to take away from this report is how behaviors from coaches about control over players' bodies enables other behaviors that are worse. And that's really what we have seen as part of the, the systemic nature of this, right? When you read this report, Vera Powell, when, when she comes into the report as a, a coach who has been alleged by players to have weight shamed and attempted to control exercise routines, it is part of this larger picture. She's not the only coach to have done this. Freed, Ben Steedy, and O.L. Rain, Paul Riley, there are multiple coaches here who are brought into this section, but it helps, I think, paint this larger picture of what has been normalized in the sport. And I think that's where a lot of the level of concern comes in. Uh, normalize is an interesting word because a lot of people, I think, will read this and think a lot of what Vera Powell is accused of is quite normal for coaches. So in the report, it says players credibly reported that Powell criticized players for their appearance, for example, saying that some players were too big while praising other players for losing weight with no apparent correlation to performance or health. Powell appeared to want to control and micromanage players' diets and exercise regimes, even when her weight loss directives were inconsistent with sports medicine best practices. For example, players reported that Powell discouraged them from eating fruit because of its sugar content. Uh, and it goes on to say the players reported that Powell 
House Commons affected a teammate struggling with an eating disorder. Uh, a lot of people will feel that for professional athletes, it's part of their job to be in shape and that it's part of a coach's job to ensure that their players are in shape. So where does this overstep the mark? Right. So I think this is now the bigger question that we're going to start having is what is within a coach's power and how should coaches have the information of players' weight and players' performance? Obviously, there is a considerable amount of sports science around this, right? But what I think, to your point, overstepping the mark is, is it tied to performance? And is it uh, communicated to players in a professional manner? And so I think this is where the potential failings are from what players have reported about it in that it is not necessarily tied to how they're performing to games. It is based entirely on look and her own personal judgment. So that's, I think, where this is where we're going to start seeing maybe systemic changes, at least in the NWSL, about how player performance and thus diet, weight, all of this, this kind of stuff, the data that goes into that is then communicated in a more professional manner and also one that takes into account players' mental health and any potential eating disorders as well. And there's nothing within this report to suggest that Vera Powell was responding to a strength and conditioning coach who had raised concerns. It, it, it sounds as though that the evidence given from the players is that this was somewhat erratic, that there were certain players that it would be pointed out to, whereas other players would be left alone. Uh, there were also concerns about how close Vera Pau and a lot of these coaches were with the players, and I guess it's a reflection maybe of the system and the lack of money within the system, that players are being housed and coaches are being housed in the same apartment block, uh, which gives coaches an awful lot of control, which most sports coaches want as much as they can, and that again, that Vera Pau at times may well have stepped over the mark. Yeah, I think, you know, again, this is this is part of a larger conversation that we're having in the league and, and we have been having in the league honestly since it started, right? Like, yes, the investigations have pushed this further, but I think there is this bigger question of investment and how much contact should coaches have and where those lines are blurred, right? Now, is Vera Powell the worst offender in terms of blurred lines? No, because again, like there are levels to this, but where I think the player's concern begins is when those boundaries start to get lowered, right? Whether that's through uh, the way that coaches are allowed to contact players, whether that's they're in social settings together, whether if there's alcohol involved, right? Or if there's some sort of perceived favoritism happening as well, right? This is where it gets into a really big gray area that is full of nuance and we're not going to have this perfect black and white answer. But I think based on everything that we have seen across the NWSL, and maybe some of this is hindsight from players, of things ringing alarm bells and saying, the contact didn't feel okay to me, right? That this was maybe behavior that was normalized and acceptable within the league in 2018 and now looking at it from what we know and what we have put into place with anti-harassment policies that also protect against power imbalances and, and things of that nature, that maybe there was something that, that felt off there. And so it's not going to be some sort of like perfect, neat, tidy thing. This is players lived experiences. And the report, I think, is honestly just trying to communicate that. The one question I think that Vera Powell will have to answer is around uh, one of the players struggling with an eating disorder and players reporting that her comments affected that player and what her response to that was. We we don't know fully what Vera Powell's response was, so she appeared in for an interview but then didn't cooperate with the investigative team. She provided a written denial of what she suspected were going to be the allegations. So obviously she knew that these allegations were out there and included in her statement were that she never remarked on any player's appearance. Do we know any more? Will that statement that Vera Powell presented, will that be released? We do, I, I think ultimately it would probably be up to her herself to, to determine if she she wants to release it publicly. I think what you're also pointing to is there is a section of this report saying that she acknowledged, and I'm, I'm going to quote this directly, acknowledged that at the end of the season, a player had raised concerns to Powell that her mistreatment had caused a teammate's eating disorder, but Powell denied any role and stated that the reporting player should have, quote, taken responsibility as an adult, end quote, by looking out for her teammate sooner. And I think that approach to a... Uh, uh, 
legitimate concern about a teammate, like that's not going to sit well with people, especially in terms of like what is expected from a leader in a team environment. And that's the bit of what happens next with Vera Powell and the Republic of Ireland, because as you're aware, uh, Vera Powell has made history this year. She has led the Republic of Ireland to a World Cup for the first time. That is the biggest question that you will have to answer, that when a player came and expressed concerns, that it doesn't appear to have been handled in the correct way. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, I do want to just kind of point out, like, all of these reports that we've gotten, because this is only this, this is the second report that we have now gotten about misconduct across the NWSL. And there is, I think, value to going through individual experiences, but also I think in light of the sum of what has happened in the NWSL is that there is this sense of when presented with a legitimate concern about behavior, that individuals in question and leaders in question never took that extra step to say, is a player being harmed or is a player at risk in this particular moment? and get it reported in a way that would have had it addressed in a in the most helpful manner. And so I think, yes, this is the biggest question of this section of if you have a player coming to you with a legitimate concern that a teammate is being negatively impacted by feedback that is apparently random and untied to performance that is actively causing a health issue, that that is not brought to the, the appropriate, you know, the next step up the ladder, that is a legitimate question that needs to be answered. Uh, as I say, Vera Powell will hopefully be on the show tomorrow and we can talk to Vera Powell and ask her all these questions on the show tomorrow night. Uh, this is a story that has been told many times before, it feels, in American sport. Uh, we've watched Athlete Day, we have spoken to the people around US gymnastics, and as you say, like the one thing that is common is that it's not as if people didn't know. People had made complaints. People had made reports. Uh, people in authority knew about this and time and time again didn't act. And it does feel from reading through this uh, very extensive report, particularly around somebody like Paul Riley, that even when complaints were made, by and large, they seem to be ignored. Right. And that, I think, you know, with my original story at The Athletic, it, yes, it was absolutely about two former players who were making an incredibly powerful choice to go on the record and tell their experiences of what they had lived through. But the other part of the article that was so important, too, was how the institutions around them, the team, the league, U.S. soccer, had failed them in their attempt to report, especially following 2021. Players had essentially mobilized against the league. Uh, to ensure that an anti-harassment policy was put into place. And the NWSL Players Association came in to help on that effort. And that was announced outside of, of anything else. They got it done before collective bargaining agreement for a new labor agreement because that's how important it was to the players to be protected, which makes sense, obviously. But the, yeah, there is this sense of every single reporting mechanism, people are pointing fingers at each other, there are gaps in the system, no one actually knows who's finally responsible even when things are reported, investigated, coaches who were terminated, those reasons were not being shared publicly, uh, mostly. And so when the next person who wanted to hire a coach down the line was trying to figure out why they you know, were moving on from their previous role, they never got an answer. So the systemic part, there's obviously going to be a lot, a lot, a lot of process changes, not just at the NWSL level, but also at the U.S. soccer level to ensure that these are being reported. They're talking about an entire restructuring of the the coaching program at U.S. soccer right now. So that way, instead of a, a red light system to flag people who are committing misconduct, instead to take it to like a green light system. So the people who are good are allowed to continue coaching. So it's a much more proactive approach to this. We've got a, a lot of projects going on here in the U.S. that are just incredibly massive undertakings as a result of everything that's happened in the NWSL through its history. Uh, this report does focus in on, on three particular interviews and Paul Riley is the focus of that article that you wrote uh, a couple of years back. For people in this country who maybe don't know who Paul Riley was, how, how big a figure was he in US football? I mean, he was a, a huge figure. He was one of the most winning coaches in the NWSL. He had, at one point, been his name had been lobbed up as a candidate for the U.S. Women's National Team. We have found out why he was never actually considered for the role as part of these investigative reports. But, you know, he had won multiple championships with, with multiple teams across multiple leagues. He had a tremendous amount of power 
not just within the professional women's landscape, but he also had a very successful youth club as well that he then also sold for millions of dollars, right? There's a, a huge profit in youth soccer here in America. So there was a real level of power that we were dealing with. And when I was reporting the story, obviously we had these two players who were willing to be named, but I also spoke to more than a dozen players who wanted to remain anonymous because they still felt that Paul Riley, no matter what the consequences of this article were that he would still be able to impact their careers, whether they were retired, coaching, still playing, out of soccer entirely, which I think really does speak to his role in the sport at that time. In this report, the first line when the joint investigative team released their findings on Paul Riley is very clear. Paul Riley engaged in sexual misconduct towards Sinead Farley and Mana Shim and goes into quite horrifying detail as to the abuse suffered by those two players and the way he ruled at the various clubs he was at. And as you say, he was allowed to move from club to club despite there being allegations all along the way. Where is Paul Riley now? And reading these accusations, I assume that criminal charges have to follow. I mean, no criminal charges have been pressed there. You know, we do have statute of limitations here. Um, Also, like every, I think, Every player who has been in these reports also has to make that decision for themselves. But, I mean, Paul Riley has basically removed himself from the spotlight a bit. He refused to participate in this joint investigation. Obviously, when we reached out to him for our original article, he sent us uh, a written statement responding to the list of questions that we had sent him. Um, But generally, you know, he, he has a a child um, that we are aware of and he he's active on Twitter a little bit and that's about all we know of him currently. And what about those who worked around him at the clubs at that time? Because a lot of this was happening uh, on team buses, uh, around team hotels, almost an understanding that he could do whatever the hell he wanted whenever he wanted. Yeah, I mean, there is a conclusion from the report, too, that Paul Riley had surrounded himself with coaches that he, you know, would acquire and then who would basically, if not enable his behavior, then at least tolerate it. Um, A lot of the former assistant coaches within his sphere have moved on to other roles. Like, we have attempted to reach out to assistant coaches who have moved into other uh, roles within soccer, generally within youth soccer, and that again, has been kind of one of the main things that we've discussed out of all the NWSL reporting is that the movement between the youth game and the pro game uh, that abusers are still lifted up out of the youth system into the pro system, but then also after people are terminated from their roles within pro soccer, they are then able to basically still re-enter that youth system because the reasons for termination are not shared. So, yeah, there's still a lot, a lot to dig into here. And most of these coaches were selling the dream. Again, going back to the gymnastics comparison, it was to become Mm -hmm. an Olympian. This is to be a professional player. And so many of the players who spoke talked about, well, my destiny was in his hands and I needed to keep him happy. Have there been any attempts to change that? Is it possible to change that philosophy within these clubs? I mean, I think that is a a fantastic question because I think so much of what we have seen over the years in this sport is that there is this sense of players should just be grateful that they are even able to play. And that's been at really every level of the women's game here in the U.S. from every version of the pro league that's existed to the U.S. women's national team when they ask for equal pay, right? That is such a defining characteristic of the space and so you lump that in with ambition to play on the national team and you're in the league right and it's so easy to take advantage of that and to also use it essentially as a tool for for further grooming you'll only make it on the national team if i'm your coach i'll get you there right and undoing a lot of that culture is a really 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 hard project but what i think i am really heartened by is U.S. soccer has formed a committee coming out of their own investigative report. And that participant safety committee is headed by Mana Shim, 
one of the players who spoke to me for this original story. So this is a player who has lived it herself, who is now working directly within the system to try and fix it. And that to me is one of the most encouraging things that I try to cling to on a daily basis. It does seem that whether it's the American game or even in the WSL in England, uh, that there's almost an acceptance of relationships between male coaches and players and not all of them are coercion not all of them are what we've read about in this report but that there is just a general acceptance that this is going to happen yeah and i think that that's been a culture here too a lot of players have married former college head coaches right like that's that's a whole generation of players essentially here so i don't know if there is a good solution for this moving forward but you know we also had an investigation here in the u.s into portland thorns head coach for this past season, Rian Wilkinson, who just led the team to a championship and who self-reported not even a relationship with a player, but just communication between her and a player where feelings were expressed, nothing was acted upon. The investigation cleared her of any rule infractions, but she still resigned because right at the moment, the culture of the NWL really does not allow for this. And so I think it's going to be a really uncomfortable conversation still moving forward, but there will, I think, be a bit of a culture shift where it the, the future generations maybe are not going to want to have that mingling because fundamentally there is a power imbalance between a staff member and a player. There is a Irish-born coach named in this as well. Christy Holly uh, was born yes. in Derry and has been coaching in the NWSL. Uh, who's Christy Holly? Christy Hawley started basically as a volunteer with a team formerly known as Sky Blue FC and then became head coach there before moving to racing Louisville. Um, his big story here is uh, Aaron Simon has alleged extreme inappropriate uh, sexual misconduct between Christy Hawley and herself in terms of inappropriate contact. You know, I mean, just I almost don't want to get into the levels of detail. They are in both reports um but christy holly once the team found out in in louisville about his behavior they did terminate him we found out in this joint investigative report that there was a severance package uh delivered to him upon his termination and that they signed a non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreement with him that basically would have also banned the team from even volunteering the information to law enforcement um so he's definitely one of the, the main figures that has been a focus of both this report and the Sally Yates report in terms of sexual misconduct and a, a number of other uh, issues that definitely cross the line in terms of the anti-harassment policy. Uh, Racing Louisville, who he was head coach with, um, have issued a lengthy statement, as many of yeah. the clubs have, and Houston Dash have apologized uh, for Vera Powell's conduct as well. The long-term responsibility or uh, impact on, on these clubs, what, what do you think that will be? So, I mean, currently we already have two clubs actually up for sale as part of this entire process. Both Portland and the Chicago Red Stars are now up for sale after their owners have basically been found to have not necessarily done the right thing in some form or another via these reports. Um, and they feel as if they need to move on in order for these clubs to survive, which I think is the right decision from both. Uh, but ultimately, you know, there's there's a few different parts that really need to happen. There's obviously just adapting policies and making them stronger, right? And that's going to be the really easy part. The harder part is going to be regaining trust of players, of fans, of really everyone who's kind of watched this play out. And the other part is going to be this bigger culture shift that we've really been talking about this whole time of finding those behaviors that have been normalized and figuring out how you undo some of that damage of educating players to know what crosses the line. I mean, one of the, I think, really concerning things in both reports is that Chicago conducted a study of its own players and the majority of the team reported behaviors that crossed the line into abuse and misconduct. And 70% of them didn't even know that. So there is a much bigger cultural and education part here that is going to be a much longer term project than just fixing some documents. 
And from talking to players over recent days and weeks, do you get the sense from them that they feel now if they do raise their voice that they'll be listened to? Because it is clear from the report that one of the issues was that a player would make a complaint and would drag on so long and they'd be given no feedback that if they were talking to a teammate who had a similar issue, they'd say, well, I, I made my complaint and nothing ever happened about it. Do, do the players feel more empowered because of this? I think more, yes. Are, is the league 100% of the way there in terms of having reporting mechanisms that are going to be trusted every single time? Absolutely not. I mean, even the joint investigation report says we had players who did not trust this process. And that, again, is this larger cultural thing of we have seen for a decade that reports are not handled correctly. So why, why would we trust you to do this one right? And that is going to be a long process of fixing it. But I think that there are both more and better reporting mechanisms following the events of the past year and a half or so in terms of anonymous reporting. I think the NWSL Players Association has played a really large role in this in terms of feeling like they have someone that is there to look out for their interests and to protect players if they do report. And I think what has been a really important shift for players too is this sense that if they do go public, if they put their name on it, that there will not be retaliation that they will be protected. And there was a new player in this most recent report, Kaylee Kurtz, who reported Paul Riley's behavior in North Carolina, who basically went through that exact process of not trusting that her report would be treated well, and then deciding to come forward during this investigation because she would feel more protected. So improvement, yes. Truly all the way there yet? Absolutely not. This report is 